Hello guys. I don't know if any, anybody is out there, but I thought I'd stream this because I realized that after the last hearing, they don't keep them up there. So Judge John Judge, um, he just, they, they stream it live and then it's gone. So I just want to keep these on my YouTube going forward. So I, I want to just stream them live. So I just heard some really interesting stuff over on Forensic Frenzies channel. Hi, Leslie. How are you? How's it going, girl? So let me just check the YouTube thing over here because I don't know if they're live yet or not. You YouTube. Nope. Okay, I'm back. So yeah, so good, good. Did you watch the eclipse? Were you in the path of totality? I'm just curious, like people that saw it. I, I was not in the path of totality and I actually stayed in. Oh, cool. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> it's not just me by myself. So anybody that's here sharing it with me, I'm happy. You're in Kansas. Okay. Oh, that's cool. I've never been to Kansas. Did you grow up there? So anyway, back to forensic frenzy. I'm just, um, I don't know if you guys watch her or not, but she has a degree in, you know, forensics and she's, she's actually really good. If you guys notice that it goes live and I'm not on there, just tell me. Yes, I did nothing to see here. Okay. <laughs> Why? Well, Obviously, I always think of The Wizard of Oz, so I'm sure you hear that all the time. Yeah, she's really good. She just put out something that's kind of interesting, although I know you're a pro burger, Leslie, so you might not be happy about what she just put out. But the reason why I like her is because she's very direct. She's no BS. Hi, Lee. Oh, you're in North Carolina. Okay, cool. I actually was just in um, South Carolina recently. Um, I was in Myrtle Beach and I go down there like kind of frequently because my parents have a place down there. So I know that's not North Carolina, but and I, I have been actually to North Carolina as well. I've been to um, Raleigh and I went to a state fair there once. It was really fun. Wh what part of North Carolina are you in? So let me just check the, the little stream there. Okay. He's, they're just taking their time over there. Oh, you're talking about the Instagram. I think you're saying, yeah, well here. So here's the thing. I'll, I'll let me focus on this for a second or I'll get distracted. I'm not ignoring you guys. I just can't do both at once because I see squirrels and I get distracted. So, um, so basically she goes into the whole, uh, Garrett Discovery. Charlotte. I want to go there. I heard Charlotte is a really beautiful place. I heard it's a really great town. Lee. I heard it's a really, really nice town. Um, so yeah, I definitely want to visit there sometime. So anyway, the, uh, she goes into the Garrett Discovery and what she says is that she contacted the, she, oh, hi, Sipanon. We are getting ready to watch the hearing of um, Idaho versus Brian Koberger. I don't know if you follow the case, but it's not, he's not, any, he's not going to trial yet. This is just one of the many hearings they keep having. And this is about the survey that Ann put out to um, 400 people in Latah County in which she asked questions that I'm pretty sure everybody already knows about. In fact, if you guys watch Get a Clue, he went over the fact that all of the questions that she had asked were already, we already know that they were already in the media, right? Like the mainstream media reported that, you know, he was arrested in Pennsylvania, that the town was in fear, which is pretty obvious anyway, um, that he's an incel. They were pushing that narrative that he's a stalker. Um, if you guys can think of any other questions, but he, he was basically, you know, they were reading the questions aloud and the I'm just going to say the real judge is Bill Thompson. Let's just be honest. He was having like 
a conniption because he felt that this was um, tainting the jury pool, right? Which is absolutely hilarious to me because, uh, first of all, all of those questions were already public knowledge. If you look at, I think it's section 2B in the non-dissemination order, which he didn't read in court, he stopped at that paragraph. It tells you that those questions were allowed. And, and um, even if those 400 people were asked questions, that's a very small survey size. And they extrapolate from that's how you do research. If anybody that's ever done research, like PhD, master's level research, this is how you do research. Um, and the judge really sort of, I lost a little respect for him because, you know, they kept saying it's not about the survey. It's about the questions you asked. The questions were perfectly normal. All of those questions, everyone already knows. Whoa. They weren't tainting anything. And even if no one had even heard the questions before, they're all, again, public knowledge. What would stop me or any of you or anybody else to send that questionnaire out to a thousand people in Latah County, Idaho? They'd probably come arrest us, right? But regardless, it's, it's public knowledge. You can ask questions. So I, I just think it's ridiculous. Yeah, Bill Thompson is a bully and a snake, right? And he behaves as if he is the judge in the courtroom. And then he and the judge have these little, this camaraderie. And Anne is like their redheaded stepchild. Okay, exactly. Scott Green told the world. Exactly. You saw the get a clue thing, which is true. But even without Scott Green involved, the mainstream media has been saying this. The mainstream media has been saying incel, stalker, you got arrested. But these are all basic facts of the case. They're in the PCA. And yes, there's definitely people that don't follow this case and don't know anything about it, about it. But regardless, I'll thank you, Leslie. But regardless, right, there's still, whether you heard it or not, it's not like suddenly you ask the question and someone's like, oh, you asked me a question. Now my mind's made up if he's guilty or not. It's ridiculous. Uh, so you've been pro since day one, but now I do think he was there and knows a lot of the truth. Yeah, sipping on. So I'm, let's be careful because Leslie's pro burger over here. I'm just, I'm just teasing guys. I'm honestly, I can, you know, I, for me, I'm not, um, I can look at it both sides and I don't get attached either way. Right. So, um, but I agree sipping on at first, I honestly didn't have any opinion. And then I started looking at it and because I'm a contrarian, that's just me by nature. I'm a contrarian. I will just take the opposite of whatever the mainstream is pushing because I'm like, these people lie. That's all they do and put a facade. So whatever they're saying, it's the opposite. Um, and then I came on YouTube and I did some digging and I saw the arrest, regardless if he's guilty or innocent, the arrest is, is BS. I got to check YouTube. I don't want to miss this with me sitting here yapping away. Okay. Um, so yes, Exactly, Leslie. Yeah, if nothing else, it's been an unveiling the past six years. So, yeah, so even if he's guilty, right, the arrest is no bueno. Like, there, it's a shady AF arrest, okay? So that bothers me a lot. Um, and so, yeah, so for a while, I was like, he's innocent. And, of course, he's innocent until proven guilty. But now I have some suspicions that he's involved in some way. But I really don't honestly know. So I'm open to anything. The media, habitual liars. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, that's the, I, I've come to the conclusion, for me at least, that the media is here just to make everyone scared shitless. They just want everybody scared. Like even with the eclipse, right? You know, everyone was like, it's the rapture. It's the end of the world. There's going to be the new Madrid earthquakes, you know, like anything that they can get people. Uh, we had a warning, like get food and water, you know, and nothing happened. And, and that's predictable because they're not going to tell us when something's about to happen. That's it's just going to happen. They love the fear. It's some energy feeding some, I don't know, I'm just going to say demonic force. I have no idea, but they just want everybody scared. So. Hi, 12 gauge Phillips. How you doing? I'd rather get my news from social media. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, and the sad part though, Leslie, right. You know, the, with this Sebastian Rogers case, I, I don't know if you guys follow that or not. I did some reporting on it and then I just kind of backed off because I saw like the shadiest shit I've ever seen with this case. Good, good gauge, 12 gauge. Um, 
Yeah, this this I ne I never did a missing per, a child case, and I didn't fo follow any because the first cr true crime I did anything on was you know Idaho Four. And let me just jump over to YouTube here real quick. Okay, and they're still not doing anything, guys. Right? No, nope. Um. So yeah. So anyway, yeah, the kid with kids, exactly, exactly. When it comes to kids, it's tough. But I was really intrigued by this case and, and it, it bothered me. You know, certain cases just reach out to you for some reason. And so I started following following it, but very quickly it became, you know, this whole shitstorm. And I've been told this is how Summer Wells' case developed. And I guess a lot of cases with kids, when they get this kind of attention, start to develop into this. And I mean, I checked out once. Um, I tried to hang in there with the United Cajun Navy narrative but then after that, when it went back and forth and then JLR jumped in the mix, I'm like, I'm out. I'm like, I'm out of this because it's starting to get crazy. I mean, it's, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Lee. I mean, I feel like that's just the times we're in. I really feel like, you know, I, I think it's there's balances where sometimes there's, there's a greater um, positive force and then there's a greater negative force. And for me, I just noticed that I'd say the past you know, decade, but definitely the past five years, that negative, the evil forces are much more prevalent. I mean, if you just look at crime in general, it's absolutely off the chain. I mean, okay, so like, I've just been keeping track of the crimes since the eclipse, right? Because I just have a theory and I'll, I'll make a video about it. But okay, th like this woman, she killed her husband and then threw her two babies out the window on the highway. And one of them died. Totally sick stuff. Okay. That would be a case that we'd focus on for a year when I was a kid. But this is just yesterday's news now. Another kid, the pre-med student, I don't know if you heard about this one, decided to go visit his mother. He's like a genius. He had a 4.5 because he was in AP classes. Decides to go visit his mother who looks like a lovely woman and says, yeah, I'm going to come see him, mom. He has a knife behind his back. He's listening to Church in the Wild from Kanye West, which I think is a cool song, but it's got that 808 beat that Kanye talks about. And then she answers the door and he stabs her fucking 70 times. Oh, sorry. I got to be careful. I'm, I'm such a prolific cursor, guys. I'm the worst. I'm like a truck driver with this stuff. Anyway, he stabs this poor mother 70 times. And then he proceeds to call the cops and let them know that he did it. And it's like, they're like, why? And he's just like, oh, I've just wanted to do it for years. Right. 808s. Yep. So, you know, and then there was one other case I saw, but it's, it's in that, just in a, in, well, I think a lot of people are, I think a lot of people are, and you have to be really careful with what you watch and what you listen to. And, you know, discernment is key right now in this world. It's really, really key. You have got to just, you know, the, the, you know, I'm not like a big Bible thumper or anything like that, but I am a spiritual person. I believe, you know, I believe in God, you know, and um, it's just one of those things where I think it's really important to strengthen that connection now more than ever. Cause I really feel like they just want us all to go into that whole transhumanism stuff. I'm not putting any of Elon Musk's chips in my brain and I don't even, I'm not even interested in, you know, that new visor, they have a new visor out for Apple. It's wild. I saw the preview for it and you can put it on and like, it looks like, you know, it, it looks really cool, right? It's like, um, it's not virtual reality. It's like augmented virtual reality. And I was like, that's cool. But, and I've tried virtual reality. Like my brother has this really cool uh, gaming lounge and it's sick, but like if you guys have ever done virtual reality, it's, it's really insane. Cause you get really immersed. You feel like you're in the place, but I get really seasick. So I can't do it very well, but regardless this thing, this new Apple thing, when you put it on, I read that the technology, it, it, it interacts with the, the cells in your retina, which is part of your brain. Okay. And so it interacts and it actually kind of transforms you into sort of part of a computer type thing. It's messed up. So yeah, I'm never putting that thing on my head. I'm not doing that. Sorry, not doing it. Um, 
So, yeah, and then the new AirPods. I was listening to another YouTube uh, creator, and I'm blanking on his name. Oh, Kane. Kane is his first name. I can't remember his last name. But um, he was talking about how the new AirPods can read our brain waves. I'm like, that's great. I mean, I'm pretty sure my phone already reads my brain waves, but I don't need it closer to my brain with the AirPods. Oculus. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the signs are everywhere, right? The symbols and the signs. They make us, they really don't want us to know any of this stuff. They certainly don't teach it in school. I mean, to me, let me just check the YouTube. Yeah, they're really just keeping us. Um, for me, I feel like, uh, you know, the best for me that it would have been so much better in school if they taught the Socratic method where you ask questions, like you ask questions to learn and not shove information down the throat and wrote memorized stuff and then regurgitate that's how i learned right that's like the public school system but socratic method is so much more uh i think it's it's so much uh it's such a better way to learn you ask someone a question and then they answer and and it makes them think and you can actually learn much better that way yeah leslie we are it's, it's, um, I'd love to have a, open up a school for kids where you teach the Socratic method. You'd have all geniuses because that, that's how you learn by asking questions. But in school, when, when I asked questions, I used to get put in the corner, um, at church too. I, used to, I was just one of those kids, you know? So yeah, absolutely. It makes you want to learn. I love to ask questions, but then, you know, I just kept asking more questions. And then when they don't know the answer, the teacher gets upset. And then you're a, tr you're a problem kid, you know? So it's, it's just like, that's not how we're meant to learn by having stuff shoved down our throat. It's like the most boring way to learn, right? Like, how are you supposed to learn that way? Um, so high Bible horse. No, there's nothing wrong with the Bible's fine. I, you know, I feel like, um, like I said, I feel like people, whether it's the Bible or, you know, whatever your faith is, it, I just feel like a spiritual connection right now in this day is, is something that's important for people because you can get lost very easily. And, um, it's, it just, it, you were a problem kid too, 12 gauge. Okay. So that's that. Hey, you're welcome here. Cause I mean, I wore the button question authority and I mean, I was just one of those, you know, one of those, and I mean, I turned out fine, but I definitely gave my parents a run for their money when I was younger. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh gosh. So, uh, so yeah, so forensic frenzy. Let me say, yeah, you got sent to the office daily. Yep. Yep. Um, I was a daydreamer too. I was always looking out the window, like just constantly daydreaming about being somewhere else, you know, lost in thought and stuff like that. So it's really easy to do that for me, even now as an adult. Gosh, judge, judge, judge. Are they canceling this thing? I don't know. Well, we'll hang out and talk and uh, see. Um, so yeah, forensic frenzy. Let me say this before I forget. Um, so she went over the Garrett discovery and it turns out this Garrett discovery has been out there for over a year. Okay. I, or, or it's been out there since December, 2022, like a week after they arrested Brian Koberger and um, who, who ordered this Garrett discovery? Where did this information come from? And I'll explain what it is if you don't know what it is yet, but where did it come from? Right. Well, I don't know if you know Justin, he he reports on true crime and he creates a lot of narratives that who knows if they're real or not. I'm not commenting on it because I don't need him over here trailing, trolling my ass, okay? But regardless, um, he said he ordered it. Maybe he did. I don't know. But but Forensic Frenzy um, said that she, she called these people up and she asked, she spoke to the owner of the company and she may in fact be interviewing this person on her on her uh channel which is awesome but they they told her flat out inside edition inside edition asked um this company that's a digital forensics company to do this uh you know deep dive into brian koberger's 
social media life. Okay. And they collated all of this data and they put it together and they spit it out and they came to some conclusions. And if you're a pro burger, you may not like some of the conclusions they came to. Okay. And she breaks it down. And if you don't follow forensic frenzy, I highly recommend her. She's really just straight up punch her right between the eyes kind of girl, very bright whoever she, if she doesn't work in this field, she has a degree in it. And she doesn't, somebody better snatch her up quick because she deserves to be paid for what she does. Good, Leslie. Yeah. I think it's important to be objective. Like you can have your feels or whatever, all about the feels, but you can't be attached to ideas and not be willing to look at new information and say, you know what, maybe this, maybe that, you know? So, um, but regardless, uh, yeah, so the Garrett discovery basically shows his Instagram accounts, who he followed, how he was connected, and big boom here, guys. He actually was, in fact, following Kaylee and Maddie. And so the, the, the issue is, you know, the hate that they get back right away is, oh, we already know. That's been proven. He wasn't following them. Stop it. Ha ha. You're stupid, right? But, like, let's just think about this for a second. Okay. I'm going to check this real quick. No, oh, no, we're still there. Let's just think about it logically for a second, guys, this Garrett discovery company, if you go look them up, they work with like international courts. They work with the department of justice. It's a company that makes money and they work for their digital forensics. So they're not just like some schlep in a basement that like put some code into their computer. Okay. So like, I'm pretty sure they want to have a business. They don't want to just get a little clout on YouTube, right? They're engineers that develop software and code to do this stuff. Right. Didn't the report say it was, uh, no, it's a bunch of profiles, Leslie, unfortunately. And here's the other thing. When these digital, if you've ever looked at any kind of OSINT type stuff, open software, where you can gather. And I've done that. I'm not trained in it, but I've looked at this stuff. Um, if you look at any of that kind of stuff, you can see if you're really good at it, which I'm not, but if you are these, these engineers, you can find all kinds of back doors to figure out and you'll need a subpoena for this stuff, right? These are white hats. If you're doing it the right way, black hats, if you want to do it the wrong way, but because the laws aren't written for a lot of this stuff yet. Okay. So Garrett discovery got all this stuff and PS, they can talk about it because guess what? They're not in the gag order because they did it the right way. Inside edition came to them and asked them, but they weren't paid. Right. And so that's how come these media companies are out there saying he stalked them. He's an incel because they got information from these companies that are legit. That's how they can do it without getting sued guys. That's, you know, so, um, yeah, Leslie, and if this guy goes on forensic frenzy and is interviewed, I'm sure she's going to ask him the tough questions because that is the kind of chick she is. And that's why I love her. I mean, she is something else. She's really good. But anyway, so yeah, so these people, these people, these engineers that d design the software, or even if they're not engineers, these people that know code and stuff, they can look and see. I mean, it's not like Brian Koberger is the only person that ever made a fake account, right? People shit post all the time. They catfish, they make fake accounts. You can find out when a person made the account, where they were when they made the account, who their real identity is. Now, if somebody's really good, they can hide it. But if they're not as good if, and you're a better coder or whatever, you can, you can get that information. So this company, Garrett Discovery, probably is able to do that if they work with the DOJ and international courts is my guess. So, you know, when people just like blow it off, like, oh, they're, that's hilarious. We already said that was his fake account. People made it up after he was arrested. Um, open up your mind a little more guys, because that's not what Garrett discovery is. It's an actual company that makes money by doing deep dive digital forensics. So that's the problem with it. And, um, you know, that's why I say if you're a pro burger, you might not like what they found. Now, I'm still willing to say, you know, that doesn't. So here's the thing, right? Here's the thing about that. OK, because I'm still willing to say innocent until proven guilty because that's I'm an American. OK, and that's just how I feel. You know, and I'm conspiracy, I'm conspiracy minded and I don't put anything past anybody. Uh. I, 
they could have found all of that stuff and it could indeed show that he had these accounts and was doing it. But that doesn't mean that somebody who's smarter didn't create all that stuff for them to find. Okay. <laughs> because the government, all right. And this is just me being a contrarian, the government, right? The government, you know, the technology that they show us, like Apple shows us this a AVR or um, any of the technology that they're showing us right now. We're like, wow, this is cool. The government's had that for like decades. Okay. The government's beyond what we even are could comprehend. So that's my point, right? So like the government can do, the government can see through our walls with drones. That's what they use in the Sebastian Rogers. And I'm not giving them permission to see through my walls with drones, but they're doing it anyway, right? We can't buy those drones though. I can't buy a drone to see through the walls with drones. Not that I want to, but the government's doing it. They are. And if you don't think they are, go check it out because they are. And it's sick. Sorry. I got to calm down because I get too worked up. And honestly, there's nothing you can do about it. So, um, all right. So here, where are we? Guys, what's going on with this live? I mean, I know what's going on here, but it's not, it's not there, right? Yeah, exactly. 12 gauge. Exactly. That's the question, right? I mean, there's, I have like a lot of different wild theories, you know, because that's, my my mind you know i've read a few interesting ones you know there's there are some theories out there that have to do with like long term family rivalries and ritual in that area and it's i kind of talked about it in the beginning like one of my first videos that's why he's late. He's going to be, he, <laughs> if that's what he's looking for, I don't know if he's going to be showing up, <laughs> Leslie, because I don't think he has any left. I'm sorry. If he ever, not, he would never watch this, right? But did you see how offended he was? Because <clears throat> uh, essentially, um, aquariums are, oh, interesting. I totally believe that sipping on. He's saying that there's CIA bio data recording mirrors. 100% believe that. Doesn't even, that reminds me of a story. See how quickly I get distracted, guys? This is why I can't do chat and talk. That's all right. I like talking to you guys. Here's a funny story. So, yeah, we know Disney is CIA, right? Since its inception. I mean, when Disney started, okay, their whole thing was making propaganda cartoons for the war. And, I mean, I don't, I'm, I don't know how old you guys are, but I'm old. And I was grown. I don't like to say I'm old, but I'm. I'm older, right? So, like, I watched those really weird ass cartoons when I was a kid where they would like put people in, like, it was like these cartoons where people were on an island and they would put them in like a pot and stew them around like they were cooking them and they were doing all these weird things. When I go back and watch it now, I'm like, what in the hell was I watching? Right. And it's like some Masonic rituals and stuff. I mean, this was all like right in your face, right? When you go back and look at some of this stuff. But anyway, Disney CIA propaganda machine all the way, right? So there you go. Tugboat Annie, right? You got it. So I remember I went, two things about Disney. Well, I remember one when I went there and yep, Leslie. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm watching it. I have no idea what I'm watching. I'm basically MK ultra, not really, but you know what I'm saying, right? It, the TV is tell lies, tell lies, vision through vision, right? You guys know in Hollywood, the magical, you know, the magic from the Holly tree. I mean, Hollywood's just all pure propaganda nonsense. And, oh gosh, it's just like, but yeah, so Disney, right? The first time I went there when I was 15, I remember it basically was like a FaceTime thing where I could look at a screen and I could talk to somebody and I was blown away by it. And then when did we get FaceTime? Not until what, like some, it was 2005 we got it somewhere around there. And in Disney had it way back then. So yeah, yep, exactly. I'm 50. I'm going to be 54 soon. So exactly, Leslie, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I watched it, but it was weird, right? Like, what do you, why are they cooking each other? And why, why are, what, what is the weird, what is this? Right. And Mickey Mouse, by the way, is not cute at all. And what it's like, 
just super weird, you know, super, super weird. Um, so, and so the next story is when, okay, cool. There we go. So when, when we went to Disney, I'll never forget this one. We went to Disney and they had installed those fingerprint things, right? Where in order to, um, 63. Okay. Um, in order now, instead of like getting a stamp on your hand, Disney decided we just want your fingerprint, right? So you put a fingerprint on there and that's how you get in and out of the park. Well, my brother was the first one to go through. Well, my brother's very much like me and privacy oriented stuff. This was years ago. I mean, I'm talking like 15 years ago. My brother lost his mind. Okay. He's like, what do you mean? My fingerprint. I'm not putting my fingerprint in there. He starts this whole ruckus. Right. And like security comes over. Right. Now he wasn't yelling, but he was just like, no, I'm not putting my finger in there. Right. And, um, he's like, losing it because they're like, well, then you can't come in the park. And then my dad's like, come on, son, just put your finger. And my brother's like, no, I'm not giving the CIA my fingerprint. My dad's like, what do you mean the CIA? And I'm like, oh my God, here we go. Right. So then me and my whole family went over to the, the guest services in Disney and we got to go through without putting our fingerprint in there. And they gave us like a card or whatever. <laughs> it was like ridiculous, but this is my family. So what are you going to do? But yeah, I remember that. That now that's what Disney did. They started that a long time ago with the fingerprint. You guys remember that stuff? So yeah, it's, it's insane. I remember I went to an orthodontist once and they tried to get me to use my fingerprint as an ID. I'm like, what? No, I'm not, I'm not doing a fingerprint for my ID. Like, this is insane. Like, absolutely not. Can I have a pen and a paper? So. Yeah, guys, like, what is going on over here? This is so weird, right? Oh, this, this is, like, the weirdest thing ever. BK was chosen based on his applications to Pullman, based on personal family and financial history. Okay. So when you say financial history, are you talking about um, the fact that he, like, in, like, his family wouldn't be able to defend him like he wouldn't have the money to defend himself maybe they dismissed the case yeah <laughs> oh my gosh we would be in an alternate universe if that i'd be like we must have shifted timelines while we were talking guys okay sipping on yeah 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 because he's an outsider right he has no support his family can't afford uh an attorney or anything like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's really messed up. It's really messed up. Uh, so it is interesting. I mean, Oh, CERN was CERN is really freaky. Did you guys see the dance they did? This lady did some really wacky dance, like right before the solar eclipse. And she was spreading salt everywhere. I'm sure it was some, like, he has no one to vouch for him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and do you remember when, when it first started, like the first week or so, and that news came out about him, which was totally false, but it came out like he was like, like naked and like, like taunting guards and all this garbage. Do you remember that? Oh, there's tons of them, 12 gates. There's tons of BKs like that in college. And that's what um, Get a Clue brought up in a video like two days ago. Let me just check over here. No. Nope. Um, that's what Get a Clue brought up in uh, two days ago when he brought up the case of, I think it was an FSU football player. And it was devastating. It's a young black man who was a division one athlete football player at FSU who was arrested by the police. And, um, I don't believe he asked how many more were arrested. Oh yeah. But he, he was arrested for murdering another young black man that it was in college even, and it, it was disgusting because the police 
within like a day or two of this man being put under arrest and in jail, the police got footage of him being elsewhere and not just one footage piece, but like three different footages. And, and he had relatives vouching for him with like 360 locator app showing he was elsewhere and like all this other stuff. And the police still kept him in jail to, to the point where it wasn't until the local news got involved and started airing this stuff. And it, 22 days later, they, they yet let this young man out of prison. But at that point, you know, his name was, was smeared and he lost that time in school and in football. It was just so disturbing and disgusting. And this happens all the time, right? I'm looking at it and it's like the kind of thing that makes you want to punch a wall and cry simultaneously. And then you get, and then you realize this is one story of like thousands, right? It was so disgusting and disturbing. And he was the same thing. He was an outsider. He was in, he couldn't afford a public defender. And if it wasn't for, this was an actual time where like a local news station stuck up for someone and did the right thing, which was so cool. You know, it was so cool, but yeah, that was, that was so, yeah, totally. Yeah. The legal government. Exactly. Exactly. That's why I like the Karen Reed case. I don't know if you guys follow that or not, but I'm, I'm going to go up there. I got to find out when the trial starts. I think it's, it might be Monday. I'm, I'm going, I'm going up to the Karen Reed case in Boston guys, because I got to see these people in person. I just have to be there. This is a historic case, that Karen Reed case, and it's legit corruption to the core, uh, total corruption to the core. And that's a, that's a white woman with wealth that's getting framed. So, you know, it happens to everybody, right? Obviously not as much to somebody like that. And I a hundred percent know that. So, but, um, that's awesome, Leslie. Yeah. But I'm just saying like, it happens to everybody. And so, you know, if it's happening to a, a white woman of wealth, it's definitely happening a million times more to, to other people who have no defenses and nobody to stick up for them. Nobody. And it's just, it's horrible. It's horrible. Um, nope, still not there. And you know what makes me even more upset? Well, that makes me equally upset, I'm going to say, is the family court system. The family court system, I, I think is, um, is a, uh, I think it's unconstitutional, personally. I don't think family, like divorce, fine, like civil divorce, divide assets, whatever, but custody cases, I, that enrages me, that enrages me that custody cases can be determined by a judge and judges should not have that power. There are so many terrible decisions made by judges and they can ruin. And, and, and here's the other thing, and this is just my opinion, but family courts, people want to talk about the patriarchy, the patriarchy. And I'm just going to put this out there. I'm not a feminist guys. I'm just not, I'm just not, just not. I think women in America, we're lucky because the rest of the world, women have it pretty bad, I think. I mean, not every country, but most countries. And in America, I really never was discriminated against based on my sex. I'm just being honest. And even with pay, I ask what I'm worth and I get it, you know? So, um, but the point I'm trying to make is that the patriarchy and family court does not exist because it's the matriarchy and family court. Let's just be straight, right? Let's just be honest. That's my opinion. And I don't want to offend anybody. And you're welcome to have a different opinion. And I know that there are outliers and different things. I totally get that. But in general, from what I've seen, fathers get shit on in family court to the point where like, they, 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 they end up depressed and suicidal. It's horrible. It's just horrible. Um. But anyway, my goodness, I'm really all over the place in this stream, guys. Thanks for hanging with me. I mean, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. They want the good men out. That's what they've done to African-American communities and any community. They want the family structure destroyed. And that's what they did. 
The Clintons came in with their big uh, prison bill, their prison industrial complex, and locked them up for the most ridiculous crimes. And then um, the music industry infiltrated it with rap music that that idolized like selling drugs. I, I'm sorry, but that's what it did. I mean, it, that's what they did. And it's just, it's so obvious when you look at it in hindsight. And trust me, I like rap music. I mean, I grew up listening. I was there when it came out, like in the 80s and 90s and all that stuff. I don't like rap music today, though. It's just denigrated to the point where I'm like, I can't listen to this. This is all they say is, it, it's just so, I, I it's, it's not even, it's not enjoyable, honestly. But it, it, you know, it's like a pounding into the minds of young, impressionable people. Yeah, you don't understand it at all, right? And then you start looking at things differently and you see what they did. And they just destroyed these communities, destroyed them. And the family structure, gone. When the father is in the home, look what happens. Look what happens, you know? And it's just so sad to me so sad to me and that's why when people say like oh racism doesn't exist systemic racism there's no laws on the books i'm like you're not looking at it in the right direction like you're not you gotta you gotta look at it like from ten thousand feet up you know you gotta step back outside and really look at what's happened here <laughs> this shit was set up a long time ago and it's still playing out you know oh yeah yep 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 I hear you 12 gauge. I hear you 12 gauge. And I, I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, yep, the welfare system, yep, exactly rightly. They want black men in prison. And you know what else? Oh, let's talk about Margaret Sanger, right? We know, we know eugenics, eugenics. Hello. And I'm not going to start about abortion, but I will say this. The, you know, the one thing Kanye was right about the one that he was right about a few, quite a few things. But when he said, when somebody, he was talking about to a certain person about, and they said, come to the Holocaust museum. And he said, let me show you my Holocaust museum because the, the amount of um, African-American children that have been aborted in this country will make you sick to your stomach. Right. And that's because culturally that's what they've been fed in those, in those communities. And it started with Margaret Sanger, a hundred percent white supremacist, eugenicist, hundred percent. They try to lie and hide that stuff, but you can find it. And it's easy, easy as pie to find it in the books. Yeah, no, I, I know he, I think he's, you know, he's just been his mind, like many others, other minds of, you know, Hollywood and artists have been manipulated, heavily manipulated when men are working. Yeah. Norbert. Yeah. Horrible person is right. Horrible person. I saw an old newspaper. I like to look up old newspapers in the archives and just type in weird stuff. And you, you'll find some really interesting things in there that disprove things that they tell us are true all the time. It's really fun. And Mark, I saw a Margaret Sanger thing and it was actually a group of like old white men and they were, they were picketing with signs saying like, we're not worthy to have children. Like we, we shouldn't have kids or so. it was, it was really messed up. I was just like, Oh my God, like this woman was terrible. So they were doing it to poor people too. I mean, they were just doing it to everybody that they thought weren't worthy of procreating, you know? But um, yeah, it was it was so disgusting. These people, are, it's just, it's really bad. And then when Planned Parenthood came out with all that, um, with that expose on what they were doing with with the the kids, it was so I couldn't watch it honestly. I can't even really talk about it much more because it's gonna make me it'll get me upset, and I don't want to get upset. I literally like I could have a meltdown talking about it. So I don't want. Sorry guys, I'm gonna. Um, so let's see. So yeah, it's already like, what is it? 730. Let me see. I'm going to, I'm just going to check and see if there's any other, what's going on over here. I'm going to look at Harsh's channel real quick. It says, oh my gosh, guys, it's on. How come it's not on judge judges channel? 
Oh my gosh, I feel so bad. All right, let me see if I can find it. What the hell is going on here? Guys, you... you this PowerPoint is being played, played for everybody with no foundation. It's not an exhibit. Uh, I think that's improper. I mean, I, I'm trying to listen to, to Dr. Edelman's testimony. I keep seeing slides changing in front of me over here, and I, I don't think that's appropriate. Well, you, you've seen the slides. I have. You, you looked at but it. Everybody else here hasn't. What I'm seeing here, though, is just an explanation of how he goes about in surveys. Understand that. That's what his testimony is. But we're getting this visual aid. That there's no foundation for a judge. Well, I, it just seems I, 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 I view, view, well. Hold on. I, I I'm viewing him as an expert. Okay? Yes, sir. He's explaining what he does. So I'm going to no problem with that. The PowerPoint's a problem. I don't have any problem with his testimony. All right. I'm sorry. I uh, testimony. All right. I'm sorry. I uh, I, I yeah. frankly I've never seen no, something like this occur. That objection. I mean, it is this is not necessarily factual. It's just an example of how he got to where where he got. That's Guys, I'm a mess. I'm so sorry. Let me put this back on here. My Lord. Oh, boy. Here we go. Coach, so I'm interested in papers said have primary circulation in the venue. Um, case like this has been reported in many other newspapers, but I wouldn't, for example, look at a newspaper published in Dallas because I don't know if somebody in Lake County would be looking at a paper in Dallas. So I look at the local coverage. I try to look at like local television coverage um, to see what the, the community is likely exposed to. While we're here, I want to ask you some questions about the non-dissemination order. Okay. That's been a hot topic, and we've heard some of it again today. Are you aware that there's a non-dissemination order in this case? Yes. How did you become aware of it? Well, the first time I became aware of it was when I was reading the newspaper coverage, because that was one of the topics of media coverage, was discussing the non-dissemination order and media's efforts to have it changed. So I was able to read it and follow it in that media coverage. So that's the first time I saw. And in January, did you receive an email from my office with the non-dissemination order? I believe I did. And you looked at a hard copy again recently? Yes. All right. Does that non-dissemination order change how you did your work? Good. Sorry, can you? Does the existence of the non-dissemination order change how you did your work? No, it did not. Have you worked in cases where there's a non-dissemination order at other times? Many times. Was the sole source of the information that you use contained in the media? Was it contained in the media? Yes. yes. Everything I used was widely disseminated through the media. Why do we listen? Did you find out where the media got the information? Yes. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Bill Thompson. I'm the Lake County Prosecutor. And it's sad to be here, but happy to be here at the same time. You turn it up. I can't hear Well, I'm going to do my best to turn this up. Yeah, you do. Yeah. 
If I put the microphone up, is that better? I don't... Yeah. So you yeah, yeah. But you don't have to type out things that are recorded here. And let me preface, there is a pending case now in court, and I in my office and the investigators have to live with the restrictions that our Supreme Court places on pretrial publicity. That said, I promise you we will share with you, through the court process or otherwise, whatever we are allowed to. I just appreciate your patience on that. The uh, factual basis for the charges are summarized in what's called a probable cause affidavit that is on file with the court. According to the rules of the Idaho Supreme Court, that is sealed until Mr. Kohlberger is physically back in Latah County and has been served with the Idaho arrest warrant. At that time, we expect that that affidavit will be available to you so you can share the true facts with all of your readers and your watchers and your listeners uh, and all the people who are interested and really need to know what's going on. So please have patience with us on that. Uh, we hope to get that to you as soon as we can. In that clip, you heard reference to the probable cause affidavit. Yes. And did you hear reference to sharing it with all your readers and watchers? readers, watchers, and listeners, and anyone else who's interested. Did your research tell you that the media took Mr. Thompson up on that offer to share this far and wide? Yes. Good afternoon, folks. What did you say? Basically, the media took that document and then published the highlights and key findings in that document and added editorial commentary to that information. So let's be clear, they didn't just read the half David, there's editorial, there's debate, there's discussion, there's spin, all of it in news stories. And these stories, for example, this one has over 200, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see it. Do you have a copy of the? Uh, I do, um, Your Honor, I have a printed copy of his PowerPoint if it would help him refresh his memory. I just can't see it. Sure. Just this is great. Right, thank you. <laughs> so example, this one is on a local television station. On YouTube alone, 130,000 views and 224 comments. So people discussing it. That's just one example of how this document was disseminated through the media in this county, just as Mr. Thompson suggested during his press conference. And did you check another media source and see that it continued to be shared? Yes, this is a second example. Um, and you can see just from the heading, it says court records unsealed. And then they go through a timeline, including information from that affidavit, um, highlighting all the key findings about the car and other things that are widely reported and disseminated from that document. It's pathetic that they have to Julie actually account, this. Saturating the community <laughs> like with obviously. prejudicial details from that document, which was reported in the press conference to be truthful as well. Um, 54,000 views, 176 comments on just one other video of, of a news clip on YouTube. And based on your research, did the story or stories continue to be shared far and wide? Yes. If Janelle Finch is joining. Cases received massive media coverage, saturated. I know, Leslie. I hope they mentioned the book. I was just thinking that. How about to social media? It was also spread through social media, and people have talked about it on social media. Yep. And do you know if misinformation and rumors ended up uh, as a result of this? information shared right from the start. Yes, and the reason I looked at this and knew it was because in the media coverage, they discussed the spreading of rumors on social media. For example, a professor who was accused by a psychic of being responsible for this. Um, other references to questioning the implication of people knew about the, um, the crime before it was reported to the police and so on. So there's been quite a bit of discussion, 
spread of the rumors, misinformation, factual information all over social media, which you'd expect in a small community such as this. Did your review of all of this information tell you as a professional, as an expert in your field, that a survey was necessary in Brian Koberger's case? Yes, based off of the uh, media coverage that I reviewed, which was over 200 plus articles and the television coverage, I thought it was appropriate to move forward to see what impact, if any, this coverage has had on the community. What kind of survey did you think would be appropriate? Um, we always use random digit dial telephone surveys um, in, in these cases. Before you tell me a little bit more about that, I want to understand the history of this kind of survey. This Is this something that you just made up all on your own? No. Where does um, this come from? So these surveys have been done for decades. Um, the first one I recall that followed a similar design and focus on case-specific items was done in 1979, um, Constantini and King in three cases in Yolo County, California. Um, this approach was done, you know, Dr. Ed Bronson, who I mentioned, my mentor, had been using it for decades, 40 years or more. Um, other experts in the field do it. John Walker in the American Taliban case, they used a similar approach that was published as well. Um, used in skilling, Boston Marathon. Um, I've used it in countless cases, so hundreds of times, I would say. <laughs> is there research that supports this process? There is. Um, one of the things we're looking at, so when you think about the survey, is the structure and, and how we test validity. So there's 40 plus years of social science literature on the impact of media coverage on jury, jury decision making. And one of the things it tells us, for example, is knowledge, but for, let's take a step back, people who regularly watch and listen to the news are more likely to know about the case. When they say know about the case, they're more likely to have case-specific information from the media. So they test similar things like we did. Have you read, seen, or heard if dot, dot, dot? And they assess how much knowledge does this person have? And then they correlate it with media consumption habits. And what you find is people that read the news regularly know more of these details than people who do not. And they find that the more information you have, the more likely you are to hold an opinion regarding the defendant's guilt or innocence. So those are some of the findings. And we craft the survey similar to the others because we want to test the validity of the survey. So if we know we should see these relationships, we should expect to see them in our survey. So we ask the same similar types of questions, and then we look at those relationships to see if we see the same thing. That's one of the ways we test the bullet of the survey. Would this be considered a methodology in your field to do surveys in this certain format? Yes, it's standard practice. We look at um, APOR, which is called the American Association of Public Opinion Research, American Society of Trial Consultants. They have professional code, how to conduct surveys, venue surveys. Um, those are the primary ones that I look at. Uh, and again, there's I've taken course training during my program on how to craft surveys, how to write questions, all of that type of thing. I've done it hundreds of times, um, testified about it. Um, so that's kind of the basis of how I craft this. And I heard you mention standards and validity. Mm -hmm. um, why, why are there standards? Why does that matter? I'm sorry, why are there standards? Yes. Well, one is you want to make sure, I mean, there, as we learn more about the research and, and human behavior, we learn more about what you should and shouldn't do. So, for example, um, there's something called social desirability. Um, people want to create a positive impression of themselves. So when you ask questions, for example, can you be a fair juror? Well, we all want to be fair people. So you're more likely to get a socially desirable response. The initial step on that was all the way back into voting. Um, in California, there was an election for governor, I think it was Davis or something like that. Uh, and all of the polling suggested he was going to win. He was African-American and um, he lost. And that was when they started looking at that. And they saw all these different impacts in terms of like race of the interviewer. All these things affect how people respond. People overestimate that they vote because you can look at voting records and it's inflated. People overestimate they have a library card and a million other things. So those are things like we look at when we craft the survey. We don't want to have social questions that lead to social desirable responses, order effects, a host of other things.
In your survey, it looks like you have sections designed in your survey. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you can you hear me? Okay. Better with the microphone. Okay, I'll try to stand closer over here. I want to I want to understand this section, the, these sections. Okay. Why do you have sections in this survey? Sections. Yes. Well, one is you don't want things to be jumping back and forth all over the place because um, it's harder to take a survey like that. You'll have more people drop off, confusion, potential order effects. So we try to organize the survey into sections. So all the key questions on one topic are together, and then the next section changes topics. So it's easier to follow. What is the purpose of section three, case awareness and prejudgment? Why is that in there? So that's the meat of the survey. That's the most important section. Um, so case awareness measures initially case recognition. We craft a recognition question based off of the media coverage. What are the things widely reported that are not overly prejudicial because you don't want to create an order that would stimulate a memory of, yes, I remember that case. So if widely reported A, B, and C facts that every you, know, you read the coverage and you see this was mentioned a hundred times, that's a widely reported fact. So we create case recognition question. Now, if somebody says, yes, I remember that case, I have read, seen or heard about it, they're asked a prejudgment question next, the guilt or innocence question. Um, then they're asked open-ended questions and then those case-specific items. Now, let's say someone does not remember the, the case based on their back, the case recognition question. We give them one more fact to see if it'll stimulate a memory. Something neutral that might stimulate a memory. You usually get one to two percent more that recall the case from that. If that person recognizes the case from there, they are also asked that prejudgment question and they continue. If they do not recognize the case, they skip the rest of the survey and they're asked demographic questions about media consumption habits and demographics. Um, the next step of the survey after the prejudgment question is uh, an open ended question What have you read, seen, or heard about the case? There might be a few others we add based off of these things we might find in the media coverage. And then they continue on to those case specific items that we've been talking about. Have you read, seen, or heard if so and so? I want to make sure I understand this and that this is clear for everybody. Those nine questions that have been the problem last week and this week, if you have somebody who says, no, I don't know that case, do you ask them those nine questions? No, they skip to the demographic questions. What? Tell me, what are the demographic questions, just to be sure? If somebody doesn't recognize the case, they immediately go to questions, for example, how often do you read the newspaper? Every day, several times a week, uh, rarely, never, something like that. Then they're asked how often they follow the local news, and then they'll ask a few demographic questions like age, gender, race, ethnicity. So if somebody doesn't remember the case, you don't infuse information or do any of the things that were brought out last week. No. I have on the screen in front of me some of the read, seen, or heard questions. Yes. What are these? You don't have to read them all. Just tell me what they are. These are nine items, which we always use. Have you read, seen, or heard if? And these are items taken from the media coverage that were widely reported. And let me be clear, widely reported hundreds and thousands of times um, and potentially prejudicial items because neutral run-of-the-mill media coverage is often not grounds for a change of that. So if somebody knew there were four victims, that's not particularly prejudicial, is it? That's a pretty benign fact. But if somebody knows, for example, um, about a prior conviction that's not admissible, that's very prejudicial. And it might be correlated with prejudgment. And I would like to know that because if it's widely prejudicial and everybody knows about it, and it's correlated pre with prejudgment, that may that would likely have an impact on my recommendations because that's the type of pre-child publicity that has been recognized by the Supreme Court, I'm sure the state court here, that is most concerning. So these kinds of questions, these case-specific questions, you do this in all the surveys that you do. Yes. And um, in this case, these nine questions came straight out of the media. Absolutely. And again, widely reported throughout the media thousands of times. 
Now, just to be clear, you gave an example of um, information that might be widely reported that's highly prejudicial that you would use in a survey. Uh, you haven't talked about Brian Koberger's survey yet, have you? Um, what do you, you haven't what? told us the nine questions. I have not. Okay. And um, we'll get there. But I want to talk about a little bit more about the history of this survey. You told us it had been used for decades. And I think you told us a little bit about some of the other really high profile cases where this survey format, the survey survey method that's been widely accepted was used. Uh, are some of these cases your cases that you've done these surveys in on this list? Yes, uh, I used these types of questions in the George Floyd case for Alexander King, who was one of the defendants. There was also a gag order or non-dissemination order in that case. The Parkland shooting case in Florida, there was a non-dissemination order in that case. Used there as well. Used it in the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting case in Pittsburgh. Um, State of Idaho v. Jonathan Renfro, which was here. State of Idaho v. Gilberto Rodriguez also used it there. And many others. I've used it a hundred times. Dr. Bronson used it more than me because he was doing it even longer than I have. Um, other experts in the field do it. This is the standard practice. Standard in your field. Yes. And are these surveys, doing a survey like this, is this just criminal defendants that ask you to do these surveys or that have any interest in doing these surveys or is it other people too? Um, other people use the same process as well, including the prosecution and the government. I think you provided an example in your PowerPoint of the government using this survey process in yes. a case that you worked on. Yes, this was the Jason Van Dyke case in Chicago. He had, uh, had been charged with shooting and killing Laquan McDonald. Um, it was like 17 shots was the famous thing. Um, it was a very significant case, interracial crime, widely reported on. Um, and the government also did their own survey to see if there was any potential bias and follow the same exact process and use case specific media items. And once again, there was a non dissemination order in that case. Earlier, you talked a little bit about validity being one of the standards. Yes. Tell me, tell me how you measure validity in one of these surveys. Sure. So this is from the professional code from the American Society of Trial Consultants. Um, as I mentioned, we want to look at things like consistency. So we want to, for example, the research tells us the more case or media items you know, you develop knowledge. And the more you know, the more likely you are to exhibit bias. So I want to test that in the survey. That's one of the reasons why I include those case specific items. Um, I also want to compare what people uh, or that item to prejudgment. So the more people know, are they more likely to prejudge? How about case specific media items? Is there specific prejudicial items in the media that are particularly concerning? Maybe I'm going to go back to my prior conviction example. If there, if there was a conviction, so I've had this happen in the case, and then years later, that conviction was thrown out and there's a new trial. Well, that's extremely prejudicial if people know about the prior jury verdict. So I want to know do people what percentage of people know that detail and is that related to prejudgment? And most importantly, when you ask the question, have you read, seen, or heard about the case, the open-ended question, do people report it? Because if they don't and they do know it, well, that's very concerning. And that's the type of problem we run into in voir dire. Sounds like that's one of the reasons you have case-specific questions in there. That's one of the reasons, absolutely. You heard talk last week and then you heard it again today about can't you just change this survey and take those case specific questions out and then do the survey? Can you do that? I would not do that, no. Can you explain why not? Because this is based off of 15 years of doing this. I know for certain, and there's research on it as well, that when you ask people an open ended question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case? they have a difficult time recalling everything from memory. That's a recall question. The cognitive effort required to recall everything from memory that you know is very challenging versus recognition, which is a much lower cognitive load. Have you read, seen, or heard if? Oh, now I can search my memory. Yes, I know that fact. If I asked you, tell me everything you know about the movie Star Wars, you would tell me a whole bunch of interesting things about Chewbacca, 
and Ewoks, and maybe a bunch of other stuff. But I am very confident that you would miss things. You would not tell me every single detail from memory you know about that movie. And then I would ask you something like, did you know that Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's father? And you'd probably say, yeah, of course, I knew that. But you didn't mention it in the recall question. Um, there's a mountain of research on this. Usually what they do is they have people read uh, like a paragraph or a story, and they ask them, write down everything you recall from what you just read. And then they do a different type of quiz. Did you read that the truck was red? Did you read that there was an ambulance? Oh yeah, of course, and they check that too. And what it shows is recognition rates, the ability to recall information when asked a closed-ended question is much higher than when you ask an open-ended question. So getting back to your comment or question, if I only ask, what do you read, know about this case? I know for a fact, you will get things like, well, I remember when it happened, there were four victims, there was a knife, um, I remember there's a delay, um, I just saw it in the media. Those are the things that people say. They've said it in this survey, they've said it in the hundred surveys I've done prior, they've said it in Vladir when I look at transcripts, that's what you see. But when you ask those closed-ended questions, you discover that they know quite a bit more. And that's what I'm trying to look at. I need to know what do people actually know, and is there information, prejudicial details that they don't mention that they do know when you ask the open-ended question. And those, those details, the closed questions, the have you read, seen, or heard questions, are they important to determine if there's bias, that media coverage has created a prejudicial effect and that there's bias? Absolutely. If 80% of people are able to recognize a prejudicial detail, um, and I keep making it up because I don't want to upset anyone here, like a prior conviction, if 80% know that detail, but only 3% mention it in the question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case, that's a major problem. I need to know that because it's an extremely prejudicial fact. Things spread on social media, whether they're true or not, they still impact the jury. Very prejudicial. I need to know if they know that. And I know for a fact in this case that, for example, I'm not going to mention the detail, but for one of them, only 3%, 3% of people in this survey Mention the detail when asked, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case? It was something spread on social media. But when you asked, have you read, seen, or heard of X, Y, and Z, 45% knew that fact. And that fact happened to be significantly related to prejudgment. People who knew it, over 80% of them think the defendant is guilty compared to 57% who don't know the detail. So those are important findings. If I don't include those questions, I can't do any of those analyses. It makes it look like there's not that much of a problem here. People don't seem to know anything. They just say they remember reading it in the paper. I guess we don't have to move the case because they don't seem to know much. And that is misleading, um, inaccurate, and I would not do that. Have you had um, a unique opportunity to kind of actually watch this in real time to see how it works? I have. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. How did you get this unique opportunity yeah. first? So the, the, I worked on a case that was called John Fight. Um, this was a Catholic priest in Hidalgo County in Texas who had been charged with murdering a beauty queen. Now the crime had happened in like the 1950s and the trial happened in like 2018 or something like that. So every, the, every all the witnesses were gone and the defendant was obviously much older, but it was a case that was just weaved in the fabric of the community. It was so shocking. And during the hearing, after doing the survey, one of the things we did is we brought in community residents and did like a mock voir dire to prove this point, to demonstrate. And there was a bunch of things in that case that were particularly prejudicial. So we asked people, tell us what you've read, seen, or heard about the case. And they would tell us, oh, in college, I learned about this case. I know A, B, and C. And say, is that everything you remember? And they said, for example, here, I believe so. That's what this person said. Search their memory. Let's see. I believe so. That's it. And then we asked those case-specific questions that you clearly could never ask in one year because you'd be poisoning the well. And we asked, for example, did you know that John Fight gave a confession to a priest, confessed to the crime? Oh yeah, I knew that. And once she said that, it stimulated her memory. Actually, he confessed twice. So now she knows that. The fact that she did not mention in the open-ended question, extremely prejudicial. The Supreme Court has recognized confessions to be very prejudicial for Doe v. Louisiana and a bunch of others. And she knows that. And then we ask, kind of again, is that everything you know? And she says yes. And then we give her another one. 
did you know that he was involved in another case? He had actually been involved, charged with attacking a woman at a different church. Oh yeah, yes, I do remember that. Once again, she knows a detail that she didn't mention. And wrote for saying, okay, and you didn't say that a few minutes ago, I did you? No, that's the second one. Um, and then we asked, having refreshed your memory, are there any other facts that you have read, seen, or heard that you haven't told the court? She's, I don't believe so. so it seems like that's all she knows. Then we tried again, and we mentioned that he um, had been transferred to another monastery. The Catholic Church was moving him around. And she knows that. She said, oh, yeah, I did do that. Uh, and we tried again. Did you know that local law enforcement um, were participating in a, in a cover-up? That was part of the story. Yep, yeah, she knows that. Too. So this was an example of the difference between asking the open-ended question that you can ask in one year, what do you know about this case? What do you heard about this case? And you get an answer. Sometimes people say, I just recall when it happened. Sometimes you get more detail. But when you start asking those closed-ended questions, you uncover that actually they know quite a bit more. Um, and that is the key point in a high-profile case. In the general case, it doesn't matter because there is no case-specific information. What we know is that specific attitudes predict behavior much more than general attitudes. So a community like this has been saturated with media coverage that's prejudicial. We want to know what case-specific details they know because that goes to bias. And are we able to ferret out that bias in jury selection? And that's why we include those questions in our survey. I want to talk about Brian Koberger's case for just a minute. Connor, again, I'm going to register the objection. This is dealing, this is going to deal with the actual issue of change of venue. It's premature. The state has not been afforded the opportunity to analyze much less, much, yet much less respond to it. Um, so to the extent the court wishes to allow this to continue, I just simply ask you to give it that reduced amount of weight because the state is not in a position to respond to any of it. <laughs> well, Thank you. So you, you'll have an opportunity to I respond love it. to any of this. I love message. it. Uh, oh, not shit. today, Judge. Cry. This, this goes, Cry. This, this you goes, little bunny. Hold on. Yes, You're sir. not going to make a decision today. Poor yes, sir. little bunny. I'm getting information. Yes, sir. And uh, then oh, I wish I'm going to right consider now. I don't know why what you're screen. going to uh, provide. He deserves every and bit then of I'm going to make a decision. My point no, again, not... Your Honor, is this goes to the issue of a change of venue, not whether or not the non-disclosure order was violated and what we should do about that. Two separate issues. The state is not prepared and will not be prepared to address a change of venue issue until an appropriate motion with supporting um, documentation and evidence provided, and we have a chance to respond to that, which I understand we'll be doing between now and sometime next month. Exactly. Thank you. He interrupted because he's Thank you. unbelievable. Dr. Edelman, um, you're, you haven't finished That's analyzing the data in Mr. Koberger's case, have you? No, the only thing I looked at was supposed to be on the question at hand, which is about these case specific items, why they're in the survey, whether, and which goes to whether we can continue the survey without them. That's the only thing I looked at was addressing that specific question. I'm not going to ask you what your opinion on change of venue is today. I don't have one. Well, I do, but I'm not done analyzing the data. Senate, I want you to be informed before we get there. So I do want to talk, though, about Brian Koberger's case and if you've been able to determine if the survey was valid. Yes, absolutely. And how did you determine that the survey is valid? Well, one of the things, as, as I mentioned, is looking at the social science research and do we find similar findings? And we did. So we also look, for example, do we have like acquiescence bias? What that means is people are just saying yes to everything. So on those case specific media items, one of the things you do is you include items that were didn't receive as much media attention. That way you wanna make sure and what you expect to see are items that get a lot of media attention, everybody knows about. So it's a really high recognition rate, 80%, 90%, 60%. And then the items that didn't get as much attention, they're lower, 40% or less. So we wanna see if there's variance across the questions and we see that as well. Does it help to do the recall questions and the recognition questions? to understand whether you have a valid survey. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, well, as I meant, those are the case-specific questions. Yeah, those media items. So we, we test validity by, are those correlated with prejudgment? Um, are they correlated with media consumption? So 
people who read more of the media, do they know more of these details than people who don't? Um, further, if you the more details you know, are you more likely to be biased? All that stuff. But also, again, like I said, is you want to check to make sure there's variance across those media items because you want to make sure people aren't just saying yes to everything. You talked early on about how if somebody doesn't recognize a case, you stop and you don't ask these case-specific media-generated items in your request. Correct. And remember, these media items also come after the open-ended, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case? Do you know how many people did not know about Brian Koberger's case in this survey, the percentage? I believe it was like 3 to 4%. And so that percentage of people didn't get the case specific questions. Is that fair? The people who did not know about the case, the very few, did not get the case specific questions. I want to talk about the open ended questions and then the have you read, seen, or heard questions. So on the open ended questions, when you say, What do you know about this case? Tell me everything. Uh, do you know about how many things people remember? Yes. So one of the things we do is we read everyone and we track how many details they mentioned, and then we compare them, what do they say, to how many case-specific items they later recognize. So for example, if somebody said, I know four people were killed and they found the guy, I would identify like the, you know, two facts, two details, for example, and then I would look at those case-specific items later, and how many of those items did he mention in the open? And that scenario would be zero, but if he knew six of them, that would tell me that if he knew six details that he failed to recognize um, versus somebody might have known all those details and mentioned all of them and they're open, then it would be zero. They reported everything they knew and they mentioned later on that they knew those items. So I look at that. You're checking what they say they know in the general open question and then see if they hit some of the specific questions right and then measuring how many more they actually know when you get to the have you read seen right. or question. And then I compare, and that kind of goes to my John Fight story, I'm looking to see if that is a problem. What did you find in this case? I found that 96% of survey respondents knew at least one additional media item that they failed to mention in the open-ended question. Um, on average, people reported 1.6 details when asked the question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case? However, on average, they later recognized six out of the nine media items. And I believe it's something like 72% knew, set, I want to say five or more. Now, in, in this situation, did you find out people had a lot of knowledge that wasn't the specific case related questions they would rattle off i know these things several things yeah so so what i found was on average people knew at 4.9 additional items that they failed to mention in the open so what does that mean that means they knew approximately five of the media items that i tested later that they did not mention in the open-ended five on average out of nine they knew, although they didn't mention it. And these are examples. So somebody wrote just what has been on the TV and the papers. That's the common thing you get when you only ask the open-ended question. But that person knew all nine of the media items we tested. Someone else mentioned the detail. The kids were murdered, and they tracked them down. Well, you actually know six out of the nine media items that we tested. Without being lately, no seven out of the nine media items tested. And it goes on and on. That is a very common finding. I find it in almost every survey I do, between 92 and 96% is the norm of what I see in terms of knowing more detail than they report. And it usually, interestingly, the average is usually around three extra media items that they failed to mention. In this case, it was 4.9, so it was higher. Do you have a way within the survey to correlate prejudicial coverage or bias for guilt with the amount of specific details recognized? Yes, because I asked those case specific questions. If I didn't, I would not be able to, because as you saw, people say things like, haven't seen anything lately. Well, that doesn't really do much for me. I can't analyze that. I can't do anything. 
I don't ask those case specific items. I can't test the validity of the survey. I can't test to see how case specific knowledge impacts group judgment. I can't test to see if there's one particular item that's highly prejudicial that we should be worried about that should, you know, that's inadmissible. What percentage knows that detail? Um, all of those things are required to do is correct. And how do you know that there's prejudgment in a case? What questions do you ask and when do you ask them to know that there's prejudgment or bias in a case? Uh, well, after the case recognition question, they're asked, based off of what you've read, seen or heard about this case, do you believe the defendant's guilty of whatever the crime is and it's on scale? Like, definitely guilty to definitely not guilty. Um, so that's a prejudgment question. I have a second follow-up question, which was actually developed from a judge that I thought was really effective. And the question was, um, would the defendant have a difficult time convincing you that he's not guilty? So it was a presumption of guilt as opposed to a presumption of innocence. This was in Tennessee. It was a high profile case. And similarly, people would report a lot of detail and then they'd say, I think he's guilty. And then they'd ask, well, can you be fair and impartial? And they'd go, yeah, I think I could be fair. I can try. I think I could do it. And then the court would ask, well, would the defendant have a difficult time convincing you that he's not guilty? And they'd say, oh, yeah, definitely. It could be hard to change my mind. So I use that question because I thought it was really effective. And it happens to correlate much better than a set-aside question with prejudgment um, and a host of other things. So do you ask those questions before you say, have you read, seen, or heard these particular Absolutely. If you didn't, you'd be creating order. So you have to do that. Will you say that again? You'd be creating what? order effects. Um, if, I, if I put in, a, in like a recognition question, some detail that's extraordinarily prejudicial, I'll go back to my prior conviction thing for the same crime, and then you say, oh, do you think he's guilty? Well, you just told me he had a jury convicted. Of course I think he's guilty. So you, 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 if you included all those nine items, and then you ask somebody, do you think he's guilty? You just gave them all this information that's prejudicial. So yes, that would be an order. Of, so we would never do that. So you ask them well ahead of case specific well, questions. They have to recognize the case. They have to agree. I know of this case. And then you ask if they already have an idea of what they think of whether Mr. Koberger is guilty or not in our case. Correct. And then you have the case recognition and you can measure the bias or the prejudicial effect of the media like with poorly. the incidence of those questions. What right? I look at is the prejudgment question, right? That's on a scale, so Likert scale. Um, and then I can look at things like, is a relationship between the number of details somebody knows and the strength of opinion? Definitely guilty, for example, if you know a lot of detail. I can look at case-specific items, uh, media items. Um, if you knew about X, is that correlated with prejudgment or bias? Is there something that, you know, and so on and on. So that's how we look at the relationship between prejudgment um, and these different factors. Were you able to determine if case knowledge was impacting bias in Brian Coverter's case? Yes. So because we asked these questions, what we found is that um, one, like, like I said, very high recognition rate. So. 79% of respondents knew at least five of these items. So the idea that we're set, like undermining his due process rights, everybody knows all this stuff, very high rates. 82% um, of respondents who recognize seven of these items or more reported that he's guilty, compared to if they only knew two or fewer, only 29% thought he was guilty. And the average was 6.2. So the average number of these details people already know, 6.2. Given specific case-related bits of information, these nine have you read, seen, or heard questions, does recognizing one of those questions, if that's a, oh yeah, I know that one, yeah. does that change the incidence of bias, or does that relate to, I've already prejudged this case? It does. Um, and what's really interesting is kind of going back to the open-ended question. So the, um, again, I won't mention the detail, but there's one that was widely reported. It's in that affidavit. And 81% um, of survey respondents knew that specific detail. 81% when we asked, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case? However, on the previous question, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case? The open-ended, only 8% reported it. 8% report it when you ask the open-ended question. 81% actually know the detail when you ask a recognition question. 
That's significant. And I can only do that analysis because we asked those questions. And 72% of people who knew that detail reported that he is guilty compared to just 47% who don't know the detail. So that's the kind of analysis we look at. What do these case specific items look like? Um, if you know this media item, is it correlated with guilt? What percentage of people know that media item? How many people mention it in the open? Is it consistent or is it a perfect overlap or nobody says, talks about it, but they all know it. In another one, only three, I think it was 3%, 3% mentioned a specific detail that was on social media, widely reported in the news, not factually accurate, a, a misrepresentation of the truth. 45% knew it in the survey, only 3% reported it in the open-ended comment. And it was extraordinarily prejudicial where if you did know it, 81% of survey respondents, if they knew that detail, indicated that the defendant was guilty. 81%, half the sample knew about it, but only 3% mentioned it when I asked the open-ended question. So again, if I didn't ask those questions, and the only thing I asked was the open-ended question, it would appear that people don't know a lot of prejudicial detail because they don't mention the detail when you ask that question. And that is, from my experience, doing post-conviction work, reading voir dire transcripts, coding transcripts, doing hundreds of jury selections, being involved in these cases, coding juror questionnaires. This is the phenomenon that we see all the time. It's nothing new. And the only way to look at it is by doing the survey this way. Before I ask the question about courts relying on surveys to make decisions, using these surveys to make decisions to change venue, when you talk about things that are in the media that aren't true or might not come in, we've heard a lot about that today. Do, are you telling me that that's still going to be in my courtroom? Things that aren't true that don't get brought out in trial, those are still going to be in the jurors' minds? Absolutely. And again, there's social science research on this, looking at the impact of inadmissible content, the effectiveness of judicial instructions, and how it impacts jury decision making. Just because you say it's not evidence doesn't mean it's not prejudicial. Just if I know it, um, it impacts how I view the defendant. It serves as a filter through how I process information. I might expect to hear that information when I can assume that I will, so it has an impact. One interesting study looked at jurors' ability or response, survey response, no, I'm sorry, participants' ability to recall the source of information. And what they found is after a few days after a trial, people couldn't recall what information they had learned from the media and what information they recalled and learned from the trial. So they assumed stuff in the media came out in trial. The idea that I can cognitively say, okay, I know this prejudicial detail and I'm going to put it in a box in my mind and never think about it and process everything um, and it's never going to affect me. It's just there's nothing to support that. It's kind of in our everyday lives. That's what our brains like. Think about what's going on in the, today with Trump and Biden and all that. Everybody has strong opinions. The idea that, oh, yeah, well, it's not legitimate or that fact is wrong. It's misinformation, so it won't affect me. There's nothing to support that. There's even research that shows you, you have people, you, they read a passage, that they write it something supporting a, a, a position that was in the passage, and then you tell them that information is not true. It's called belief perseverance or belief persistence. And what they find is even when you tell them that fact is not true, they still have a difficult time not believing it. It still impacts their views. They still defend it, even then. So there's a host of research on this. The idea that we should only test things that are factually accurate and assume that the other stuff isn't prejudicial is just ridiculous. So a massive amount of prejudicial media coverage is a factor that has to be considered in a case with this kind of coverage. Is that right? Yes. I, I want to know, though, from your experience, have you done a survey like this that contained these nine case-specific questions where a judge decided to change venue? Yes. Will you tell us about that? Yes. So in, in Nichols, it was a case in Washington, and this is kind of what I was referring to. So it was a defendant who had been convicted in 2012 for murder, Grant County, Washington. Um, later, it was a high profile case, and then later the conviction was thrown out. It had something to do with jury instructions or something like that, and there was gonna be a new trial. And you know, quite a bit of time had gone by, like a decade. Um, so we did a survey because 
that fact, knowing that detail, would be highly prejudicial. So what we found was 42% of, or of survey respondents had read, seen, or heard about the prior conviction when we asked that case-specific media item. However, when we asked the open-ended question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case? Only 12% mentioned it. So 12% mentioned it when you ask the open-ended question you use in voir dire, but over 42% knew about it. Now, you could never ask a juror, well, did you know a jury convicted him of murder if you didn't mention it because you're poisoning the well? Um, and the court agreed and was worried about the effectiveness of voir dire as a remedy in that situation and granted a change of that. Have you had the opportunity um, to pay attention to any prejudicial media coverage since the hearing last week? I have. What is that coverage? Well, it created a misrepresentation, false narrative that we, myself specifically, had done something to it wrong to poison the well, taint the jury pool, um, and using language like that. That became part of the narrative. Um, I saw it on Reddit, on social media, in the news, that once again, going into this idea of what the story was, that the defense had done something wrong, debate about whether it was part of their tactic to delay, um, get them off on a technicality, and so on. And again, what I did, just want to be clear, is the standard practice in the industry done hundreds of times in high profile cases throughout this country. There's nothing I did to contaminate the jury pool. Everything I included was widely disseminated by the media in this county hundreds of times, if not more. And they, most of it came directly from an affidavit that the government released in a press conference and encouraged everyone to report. Did I tell you what questions to ask? You did not. Would you take my advice if I told you what questions to ask? I would not. And I'll tell you why is, as I mentioned, my role is to be an objective expert to provide the court with information so the court can make a decision on if any remedial measures are necessary. If I don't care what questions you wanted to survey, and I don't care what questions the government wants to survey. What I want to do is conduct a valid survey that's objective reliable and provides meaningful information that can be used by the court. Do you believe comparative surveys in other counties would provide the court with more information about what to do when we get to change a venue hearing? I do. Why? Because this case has received a lot of media attention across the state. It's a national case. And depending on what the results are of the survey, I'm assuming if we find that there's grounds for a change of venue here, that's a recommendation, the response will be, well, there's nowhere else to move it. Everybody's been cut saturated with free child publicity, so there's no need to change it. The point of the comparison survey is to address that question. Is there anywhere in the state where you could move it? Maybe there's not, I don't know. Um, but that's the only way to find out. And you have to conduct the survey in the same manner. I don't know if I just ask people what they know about the case and you get general, I just recall when it happened, but you have the same guilt rate. Do they know inadmissible details? Do they know about things from that affidavit? Do they have a lot of case specific knowledge or is it just a general awareness of the case? Do they drive by the house where the crime occurred? All these things, all these things that make this county unique that you want to test for in other communities. So it's not just a question of general awareness. I need to know case specific information they have, what misinformation they have, what media items they've been exposed to. Do they have as much uh, case detail and knowledge as they do here? All of those things. So that's why I would suggest it's important. Um, without that, the only thing I can do would be to collect the media coverage and assess, for example, like are there fewer articles published in Bonneville County or Ada County compared to here? That's all we have. I wouldn't conduct a survey that I know is going to be to misleading information. I'm not going to do that. To change the survey, would that go against the methodology that you use? Yes. If I, if I change the survey and I don't include those items, I can't test. Well, do people know a lot of case-specific information that was widely reported? Are those specific items related to bias? Um, which items do they know? Do they know the ones that were all over social media or not? Like, that's the whole point of asking those questions. 
what you'll get is, well, I don't know much, but I saw it when it first happened. I remember reading about it a while ago, but haven't seen anything lately. I know the defendant was, uh, you know, arrested or whatever, um, or things like, oh, I followed it closely. Okay, great. I followed it closely. Does that mean they know a lot? I don't know. I can't assess just from someone say, I've read the news or I followed it quite a bit. That doesn't tell you anything. That's not meaningful information. So yes, we need to conduct it in some fashion. Last week, your professionalism, your work, your reputation was impugned. I believe it was, yes. If you're allowed, if the court says, okay, go ahead and finish these surveys, I want comparative county information, are you willing to still work with us? If we do it correctly, if the idea is we want you to conduct a leading bias survey to get results that we want, then no, I'm not going to do something that undermines my credibility, my objectivity, or do it in any way that's not consistent with the procedures and standards that have been used. Thank you. I don't have any other questions, Dr. Edelman, but the state, right? Okay? Johnson, thank you. Um, I mean, we'll start going backwards here, or from the back end of the, the front topic. Um, I'm sorry if you're feeling hurt about us raising this issue. I can see you were almost breaking down a few minutes ago when you were talking about slide number 33, uh, oh, slide number 31. That's not the intent, and it's certainly, I was, I'm surprised to see that reaction from an experienced expert such as yourself. So I really? apologize for that. I, I accept your apology. But the idea of after you're working really hard 15 years to develop a credible reputation and being told on uh, watching on a Zoom that I am tainting the jury board, Good for him. poisoning the jury board, and contaminating the jury board by doing what's required and standard, I'm not crying. I'm no. angry. Okay. Yes, it does not And Please go ahead and be as angry as you like as you continue from your work for the defense in this case. Oh, um, he's a dick. Wow. It is a fact, though, that you don't know of the, what, 400 citizens that were questioned on this survey. Oh, uh, I don't you know. You don't know which one ones of right. them did not already previously know any of the fact-specific representations in your questions. Isn't that true? Oh my I God. Because they answered yes or no to the question. No. Oh, well, okay. Before you asked the question, you didn't know that. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And no, so somebody who hasn't he's not heard a the representation in that one slide that you acknowledged was false. What? Uh, let's see. You acknowledge false that uh, Mr. Kilbert allegedly stalked one of the victims. That's false. You know that to be false. Which one? That Mr. Kilbert allegedly stalked one of the victims. Yes, I was trying not to say that because. But, but, you, but you, knew, you knew that was false. I did. Yes. And so you have now, for anybody That's who false. has never heard that before, mm -hmm. that question is now planted into the, them unqualified representation that Mr. Kilbert stalked one of the witnesses. And that's false. That's false. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. I like how he questioned it. So now we know that's false. Interesting. Thanks, Bill. Who? What side is he arguing for? And just to follow up on that, early on in your I'm testimony, um, you testified. I want to make sure that we heard this correctly. That inadmissible or false information. It can be the most prejudicial information. It can be. Yes. And your surveyors put that false information into the minds of people who were asked that question who may not have previously heard it. Correct. Correct. Relative Thank to you. media. Thank you. It's mentioned it hundreds of thousands of times. And, and just, just make sure we're clear to... Um, Around the same time in your testimony. Okay. Um, I didn't see that question. That's interesting. I believe you testified that you don't care if the information that you put in your specific questions to uh, the people being surveyed is correct. That you said that, didn't you? Right. I don't know what you mean by correct. True or false? I care about whether or not it's proliferated by the media. You don't it's care true. if it's true. 
No, I don't. I don't no. care about is it prejudice. So it's okay it's to true. taint people who had never heard that information for for the end result of identifying others who have and might have bias. Is you're that, is that your statement? I'm going to object to the questions. He's, he can he's the question. badgering. Wait, wait, wait. Let me yeah, finish my objection. Yeah, it's an objection. He's badgering the witness. He's misstating his testimony, and I object. The witness testified he didn't care if the information was correct, Judge. Um, yeah, overruled. So, man, yeah, just, Bill doesn't yeah, understand just, how no, science okay. One person can talk honestly. at a time. And, you know, let's take down the tone a little bit. Yes, yes sir. Bill. He can't win on merit, so he has to bully with his voice. Okay, just so we're clear, the questions, fact-specific questions were propounded to people who were taking the survey, um, did not, after asking the question even, uh, qualify the false facts as saying, this may or may not be true, or this is actually a false fact. You didn't, the survey didn't it tell them true or that false. what they might have heard was false. To see what people think. First of all, I don't call them facts because they're media items. And then second of all, that would be ridiculous. And no, I wouldn't do that. Thank answer. you. They're questions. They're not facts. Are you suggesting I follow up? Have you read, seen, or heard if he stalked them? Oh, by the way, if you know that, let me tell you, it's not true. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm suggesting because isn't that exactly what happens in the poor deer process? No. Absolutely it does. Your Honor, I'm going to object argumentative. Okay, yeah, you don't get to testify exactly about that, so I'll sustain you. Dr. Elman, have you participated as an attorney in voir dire in Idaho under Idaho laws? Have I what? Have you participated as an attorney in voir dire, conducted voir dire in a criminal case in Idaho? No, I have. A survey is not the same as a voir dire. He's so butthurt over the survey. And just to be clear, because um, in two places, at the beginning and at the end of your testimony and your PowerPoint, this PowerPoint you, you created that. Was we get to, see, get to so see what he's going to be like trial. The, what the contents of the PowerPoint speaks. Yes. Both, this is. Um, just to be clear, not every that specific question that your surveyors asked came directly from the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that true? Well, to be clear, they're not facts. They're media items. They're the representatives of representations You're of facts. I'm going to object. And the PC I'm objecting and ask that he allow Dr. Edelman to complete his answer before he jumps back in. They're simple yes or no questions. What was your question? Oh, yeah. This judge I mean, better get uh, some control in the courtroom. Let's just say one at a time, okay? Listen to him answer and we'll be through at some point. Thank you. So Dr. Elvin, isn't it true that there are among the nine fact specific questions, that's my characterization of the nine questions, we know which ones we're talking about. Not all of the representations in those questions came from the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that true? That is true. And are you aware that under Idaho law, probable cause affidavits in criminal cases become open to the public by operation of court rule once a person is arrested and appears in court? I'm sure that's true. I'm just not used to having press conferences to tell the media to disseminate the information far and wide. Oh, so let's talk about that. That press conference was made prior to Mr. Coburn's appearance, prior to the release of the affidavit, and the press conference only referred the media to what would be part of the official court record. Isn't that true? I don't know. You know all I heard was, this is going to be released. I encourage you to tell your listeners and viewers and anybody who's interested in the truth by going to the court record and looking at the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that true? I mean, recall you saying, I want you to go to the court record and look at the probable cause affidavit. And what it did was see- You're splitting hairs now, doctor. That's fine. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Thank you. 
So, okay, go ahead. Let's Thank see. you. I want to start with the probable cause affidavit, and I think you testified that that probable cause affidavit was spread far and wide in the media over and over again. Do you recall that? Let me be clear. It wasn't the probable cause affidavit that was spread far and wide. It was details taken from it, put in media stories with editorial comments back and forth in the context of news stories. It wasn't Here's a, a, a document from the government that was in the court record. Let me read it to you. That's not how it works. It's media coverage. That's how it's reported. Taken out of a DNA cell, all the other stuff in there, reported within the context of a news story. So the news takes this document, takes things from it, and runs with it, spins with it, changes it, talks about it, and sends it in. Yes. Sometimes you think the media gets it wrong after they read something. Sorry, what? Does the media ever get it wrong after they read something? Yes. And do those stories have any less prejudice on somebody's, on, on the reader of that media, whether they're wrong or not? No. And going back to, I don't care if it's true or not, my focus is to assess whether or not media coverage is prejudicial. Prejudicial and whether or not it's developed led to opinions. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. You don't say, well, I won't test all this prejudicial stuff in the media because it's not true, so I won't include it in the survey, and I'll just assume that it had no impact on people. I find it convenient to be able to disseminate a whole bunch of prejudicial media coverage, saturate the community, and then say, oh, you have no right to test the impact of that information on, on the jury board. So it's wonderful that you get the benefit of generating all the bias by releasing it to the media and then saying, no, you're constrained defense. You're not allowed to ask questions about it because that stuff's not true. Or you have to, you might have told one person in the jury pool a detail they didn't know. Oh, they knew the other seven details that are highly prejudicial, but it was that one that shifted everything and that's gonna lead to the, the contamination. Not the thousands of newspaper stories not the media coverage, not the stuff on social media. It was because a survey vendor called 400 people and asked the question that one person or two people in that panel or whatever it was in that 400 may not have known that one detail. They knew everything else. They're already biased, but it was because they learned that one detail, that's what shifted the scales. That to me is just ridiculous. And if somebody said, I don't know anything about this case, did you stop? Yes. Mr. Thompson was talking to you about the difference between uh, in the survey between closed questions and what can happen in board dire. Yes. I, you are not an attorney, is that correct? Correct. Well, what's the difference between what you can do in a survey and what you can do in board dire as far as your expertise? Well, again, I sit in jury selections. I've done hundreds of them. I've done research on one year transcripts. I've done post trial interviews for hundreds of times. So I have a pretty good idea of how the process works. Um, in a survey, I can ask those case specific media items. Well, someone says, I just recall what was in the newspaper to the open. I can ask a follow up Have you read or heard if David Nichols was convicted by a jury for murder? Could never do that in a voir dire because you'd be poisoning the well, just like in the John White case. Um, I rarely see during voir dire somebody admits a comments on something like, oh, I read this, and then there's a whole discussion and explaining to everybody, well, that's not really true. That fact was just in social media. It's wrong. That is not a normal common thing that I've seen in voir dire. In your experience, 15 years you said doing this work have you had a situation where you've been stopped midway through your process? No. What do you care about? What's what? What do you care about? I've, I've heard you say that whether what the media sends out there, whether all of those things are actually true or whether it's a spin off other information, that's not what's important to you. What do you care about in your work? What I'm interested in is assessing if there's prejudicial media coverage. Inadmissible prejudicial media coverage is some of the most concerning. 
misinformation is some of the most concerning. What I care about is what extent of that stuff has permeated the jury pool, what do people know, and do those specific details generate bias, prejudgment? Again, I, I just, the idea that there can be all this stuff out in the public that's uh, misinformation, prejudicial, that benefits one side, and you're not allowed to ask if people know that detail because you might taint one person who already knows a whole bunch of information. But that, again, like knowing the, the, the detail about the stalking comment. Okay, that person knows all this stuff, but that's the thing that's gonna change everything. And now the person's poisoned because they heard it in a survey. But the fact that there's thousands of newspaper articles and television stories and comments on social media, um, 80% of people in this community have talked about this case according to the survey. None of that matters. It's because I did a survey and asked that question. I mean, that's just, I just, I don't even know what to say. You still want to finish the surveys if we're allowed to do them right? I'm sorry? Will you still do the surveys if we're allowed to do them right? Yes, if we're doing them correctly, I'm open to continuing. Now, I think this whole thing has created quite a whole new narrative that it's almost wrong that the defense is doing something inappropriate by doing the same standard survey that's been done hundreds of times yeah, in other case, cases, yes. including in Idaho. Me too. Um, so I, I don't know how people will respond career. because of all of this and what it's generated, but I would certainly try if we're doing the Bad same Bad mouth this guy. Thank you. I don't have any questions. This guy's been doing this a long time. So one thing I just want to sort of clear up because it's come up here back and forth back and forth uh, with the uh, the questions that aren't true okay? and those uh, those were not in the uh, the probable cause affidavit and so I think it does have some bearing on the non dissemination order because our whole purpose, okay, both, both. Oh my God, the judge both, doesn't even uh, get it. Counsel, I can't with these uh, people. We're trying to protect these things from coming out. To the public, <laughs> I think so too, to Leslie. Media. That's, I think, one of the, the, the judge, I can't. issue, okay, or the concern about these particular statements. So there were two questions right at the end. Exactly. Um, this guy's looking at the judge and, like, bro, how did you become the a judge? The ethics, okay, of the lawyers, basically, this uh, non-dissemination order is I could really, ask a question uh, and send it to a thousand people. It's got nothing to do with the non-dissemination. The judge doesn't even know his own non-dissemination uh, order. I can't. I can't. I don't know if I'm going to be able to survive an actual and trial with this that, judge and Bill Thompson. Uh, is how, you know, putting this information out to the public is information contained in the public record. Okay, so the public record is oh my god, a case this guy! I bet you this guy is internally screaming right available now. Available to the public. That's he's ready to guzzle vodka. And so to to then it's say like well, this guy. I can't. We have oh, these I other can't. issues, okay, of concern. Uh, that have been spread First through the media, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, that we need I mean, to I get it. I can read between that. the lines. Then a lot of it, it, it is a what you're trying to tell me. to balance this. So I'm just not accusing anybody. I'm just saying this. This is one of the well, things I think that's, that's what um, or pulled. Sipping uh, was trying to say. I mean, honestly, I could, I could really go. I could go like very in one direction that would be situation. off the wall to most okay, people. To I'm not going to do make that. that fair but I right. hear what okay, you're saying, so That's what that's about. Yeah. Like, I'm not asking you to like, um, answer anything. Else, but I'm just trying to think what do they call this solution. people? Um, I'm not going to say uh, the word. I don't know if there is a solution. You know what I'm saying? Okay, it's out there. But it it does have some bearing. I mean, in some ways, it reminds me of Shakespeare. And what you're saying all is, the world to play uh, and all, can't all the use all the world to play duty, and all uh, the uh, apply the and act, you know, surveys. I mean, in some ways, to, like uh, it's just a plea um, that you need you know. the same questions. Otherwise, but, it's not legitimate. Yeah. Well, 
Let me ask you this. Okay. So if you said the judge is having it, I mean, let me ask you this. So but, okay. if you said you can ask certain case like media items, like the other seven, for example, that may come from left. the record, um, that's a possibility because you you can still measure what we're talking about. These specific knowledge when you ask these questions is high. These the more you know, the more likely they are to be prejudiced and biased. And you see differences in the it's data. Me and you, Leslie. Different health. <laughs> now you have to acknowledge there's even other stuff out there that's highly prejudicial. Um, and we will not know yes, if exactly, the rate Leslie. of, of yes. the awareness of those details are, are as significant as they are here. So then it's it's an unknown. So if, if the argument is, well, it doesn't look so bad because all they know are the things of in the affidavit, for example. Well, well you're you're it, there's this unknown out there again, because those items happen to be one of mm -hmm. some of the more prejudicial yep. items. Um, that yep, we yep, yep. Yeah, and this is a death penalty case. And so uh, when we're talking to jurors, we're going to probably talk to a lot of jurors individually. Sure. And it's <laughs> going to be on the record. And we're going to talk oh about gosh. them, about what they think or what they've heard uh, in, in real detail. I mean, so, there's a lot of things, there's, there's a lot of factors okay, so that point to that, I am, to be honest. But I haven't seen yeah, any I guess I'm kind of wondering yet, too, in terms like I've of, seen in many other things um, that I'm not going to mention all here. All the people that but, may um, have been called. I'm just talking around the subject, you know. didn't pick up the phone. Um, or don't want to but it, it wouldn't phone. shock me to be honest. Everybody knows, it just okay, that, um, oh, I don't know this person, it's my phone is written. Yeah, and I'm not, and, and then there are lots of people, <laughs> including me, that would never, never, yeah, answer a question, okay, on the phone because it has all so the how red do you, flags. How do you deal with Walmart, that? How do you balance that? There could be, and there's other things, you know, 400 people there, you know, out there. In Lake Tahoe County, so that say, in on I, I don't want to say anything. I'm just hooked this. in. Yeah. That's what they're like you, to do, though. After that, they like well, to do. So, you have two they things. So, unpacking both of us. So, the jury selection question, like, I'm sure you've done a million of these. I've done quite a bit. I've done a lot of high price violence. And from my experience, asking people in a general case, like a DUI, um, what do you think about DUI? And they tell you generally I'm against it. That doesn't mean you know, I have a I big issue with that. Up whatever. That doesn't mean they can't be just start because having like it's a like general attitude. Philosophical it's nothing case specific. And there's a survey of studies that show general yeah. attitudes are much less predictive than case than specific attitudes. <laughs> this is different and unique because we're talking about attitudes and beliefs. Bills over there towards you know. case. That's a whole different animal. Not and that's the unique nature of hyper cases. You know, when you talk to people individually. You still have the memory. You still have the recall. Pass the like piece you will, they will not. You will not elicit everything that you It's just memory does not work. It doesn't matter if they're under oath, private. There's so much research on it. It doesn't. Our brains don't change just because we're under oath. We work the way they work. Um, your other question goes to um, response bias. Like, what's the response rate? Um, is there something unique about the people you miss and so on? So there's a lot of work on that. And one of the things we do is why we we collect like demographic information to see, are we missing groups? Are we overrepresenting one group or the other? If we are, is there a relationship between that factor and bias? Um, and there's a lot of research on response rates and what it finds is surveys that have high response rates where like everybody takes their survey and surveys that have low response rates. Yeah, um, where it's like exactly. Less than 10% and you compare them with like public opinion polling and so on. Politics, I mean, Bill no is difference. getting jealous you right find now. Very, in in because, most instances, um, the results are the same. The judge is forming so a, high response a rates are not necessarily with this guy here. With more and Bill reliable, is valid, like not um, happy about survey it. findings. And, and that's something they've done a lot of work on because survey rates or response rates have gone down. Like that. I think oh, something about that. Yeah, they have. For sure. Well, I mean, yeah. So I mean, could be that you're just getting people who like to talk on the phone here with strangers. Yeah, and I, from, from this case, I think people are so invested in it, like a lot of unique things. So people, you know, talking about what's happening, oh, they're very invested in this case. It's unique in small community, it's not surprising. Um, Here's a virtual. But just be, what, what, what I'm finding, and there's so much virtual hug, prejudgment, guys. detail, and so on. I feel like I Isaac Cappy, it, right? I, I think Remember it's fairly hugs? representative of what you're Virtual see. hugs from Isaac Cappy. Almost everybody in this jury pulled knew about the case, like comparable to like the George Floyd case. Um, the bias was the same in terms of comparing it, not to um, show him, who was the one 
George Floyd, it's like Alexander King, who was another officer on the scene, like the race or similar to that. So that was another high profile case that was a lot of tension and stress and so on. And we still got very meaningful data. And, and you know, we've done so many times, like we kind of understand like response rates are going to be lower, um, but there's nothing to indicate Wait, that. Yeah. Wait, for example, eight of my cats missing the port had kittens. Plate. So you had and if you were, cats, we waited eight, eight of them had kittens. So, so, so in Lazar County, it was uh, about one percent. You have a cat named Cat Cappy. Yeah, so hypothetically, if we say, oh, well, I mean, one of the one of these uh, counties that are interested in native cats, which is that, you got you're yeah. spitting me. You have a cat for named Cappy. Um. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> Leslie. would it be one percent of the population? Hey, of and Jack and no. man. So okay, so so that's, that's I, I was ever. kind of wondering about it. I did a live meditation. About, you know, two thousand people. Yeah. Oh my God! So okay. what, this is like crazy. Yeah. 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 So, so this is insane. Um, you can take a. Small I did a live meditation one time. He was doing a live so one like, time in the meditation, and I was there for that. I the sample sizes are similar to here. Maybe it's a thousand. Now you're generalizing to every city, right, county, okay. so on across the country. Um, everybody has a known probability. You know what's going on with the judge. How, the how you pick your sample size, mm. there's this called power analysis. So remember, you know how you see mm. polls of snake? You see a number like 90%, and they say plus or minus 5%. Uh, so it's either 85 to 90 Basically, it's plus or minus. Are these two? Are they That's two, kind of industry standard. Does the judge and really need to understand the ins and outs? So, Let's say uh, this guy's dissertation um, on surveying. Yes or no question. I mean, it's, I don't think it's really. Say yes. You did it too, Sip? No. Yes. So that's, that's a lot of variance. Like that we were on the so same that's one. Are you shitting me? Scenario. How many people oh do you need to talk to? That's so, so if awesome. If that happens, um, your confidence interval is plus that's or minus. That's so cool. 100%. Good old Periscope. Um, and that comes up to 400. Sucks that they so got rid of that. Periscope. If you did Ada County, it would be 400. And your confidence interval would be the same as this here. Whatever that's called. Anyway, so as long as it. Uh, is using the general concept of a randomized sample, you can generalize that population for this. So if I kind of interpreted this uh, with one of your answers just a moment ago about the um, getting rid of the question instead of false, okay, that just came from the media that it did not come from the uh, public. Uh, well, from the public, but not the legal part. Um, would you go away, go ahead with that and have legitimate is he ask, This is unbelievable. Data. So, I think, I think you have the nine questions. So, if you look at it, are the other ones okay? Are you telling me there's two that you would like to exclude and keep the other seven? Well, I mean, I'm, yes. I'm not, I haven't made a decision, but I'm just wondering I if, copy, honestly. I mean, I at just... first, in your testimony, you said, well, if we, if we can't, I can't do it without doing the same questions. No, he can't. That's called replication that's, and that's one scientific of the, studies. That's one of the problems, okay, the, the, uh, part of this argument. I mean, if, if maybe it can be done without uh sort of sending information out there that is false. It can't be replicated. Be, it has to be replicated you know, identically. That's how you do science. Looking into that scientific research. That it this is, judge is making my brain hurt right now, man. Even though I they shouldn't. And I get it. Um, is that real, something like, that no, just can annoying. be done? Like, at least well, try to make it logical. If you do it that way, you're, you're, there are potential Try to make, make it logical. Um, can you do that, guys? And again, I, the thing I struggle with, and I get, I understand the public record. Just and this man, God bless his before. patience with the judge. Um, seriously, the thing I get to is like we're not really disseminating it. We're asking if people know about exactly, detail Seth. that has been disseminated to the megaphone of the media. So I'm really trying to just track what people know. I'm, I'm not trying to pass on information to a megaphone. The, ju the, so like the judge just at, after five, like five hundred thousand, basically, you know. Passing the blunt around for 20 minutes, talking about, doing it that way. you Seems know, like how these movies are conducted. Of, of the judge said to him, well, you know, I don't really like these questions the that you're asking that are false. Getting a, a huge black hole. Well, we don't know what percentage knows this highly prejudicial detail. 
it's not like, what are the odds but of, anyway like, what impact you don't like is, the, I mean, the survey going to have on the jury that are false relative can you do, can you replicate the study so, in another you town ever, without you ever, question the answer is no the answer is no you cannot so you say, well, well, you're, you're doing uh, comparisons you and making statistical analyses and you have to replicate it the exact same way determining Guilt or like that's innocence, logical. Not, you don't need uh, to have ever done a research study to know the answer to that. And don't tell me the judge uh, doesn't know the answer to that unless he was like a are, legacy uh, student at his law school. Answer to our questions okay? and, and we, inbred legacy student. Uh, want to be careful that we're not then maybe he doesn't understand that. You know? that not going to understand. So, yeah, so we do always, there's an introduction and there's, kind of, there's no right or wrong answers. To any of your questions, you could always say no opinion or I don't know to any question. Uh, I think it's outrageous. I think it's, I'm sorry, I'm talking over this, guys. So but it's, I, I have to say, to it's outrageous. The, the, there's even a conversation, right, says you may have, uh, about the fact that go they asked the media. questions. Um, to you people. may have already. And what's even crazier is the questions are questions um, that were either from the PCA like some of these or in the media or in Scott so Green's book or whatever, right? Not, not like and the question like, hey, um, have you heard about the Linda Lane footage? Do you know that there's a theory that people are fighting at Linda Lane? Did you hear that like people think that on Banfield there were people in the car? not going way out there with wild speculation. Now we don't jump into it. We don't say we're an authority. You know, it's usually... No, I know you, you don't say that. Exactly. I that yeah. Yeah. Which, by the way, we, we can she could ask those questions if she wanted to. She could. Like so I said, me and you, Leslie, uh, we could decide that we're too is, curious like, with the people would, they talk about. We're going to say, for example, not everything in the media is true. And ask um, they get a lot of really things wrong. Funky ass you questions. You, you would not want to say them, that before you do the prejudgment. Right? You can do that. And after. mail them. We can ask them whatever the we want. Because I, I, what I want to know. And then they can mail it back to other people's opinions. And then them we can instructions mail it to the other counties in Idaho. And then we can give Ann our results. What are they going to do about that? This person. I mean, I'm sure that the, they would go and report us to the bill, and then maybe Ian would fly out to specific Kansas. stuff because otherwise it's South just, Carolina, right? Yes or no, and you can't determine bias well, get just the, from that. out of well, here. Yeah, like, so come we, the on. Question comes before They're the arguing this right. much over like quick, questions and survey. This is outrageous. This is outrageous to me. No. So the question is, do and you I know even some attorney that based off of saying what you've this, read, they, you know, heard they agree that these think questions think were so ridiculous so and, and unbelievable. Or, 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 I'm so, I'm not an attorney, skin, but I like yes, you, Les. I have common sense. It's probably guilty. And I, know, I don't I don't see the logic in it. I'm not buying it. Based off of what I they've already been bullshit. supposed to without you giving them anything. So they have no a question cannot sway a person one way or another. A question does not do that. Uh, do you and believe in things? Business. And then you get to those case specific. Media. No. See, that's when you yes, can, whatever it might be. Theoretically, right? measure bias. Exactly. Yeah, well, I mean, I yeah it's not like she even went there. It's not like she was like, do you know that, earlier, you know, right? there so was an accusation that, you know, yeah, yeah she so didn't bring up, you know, you can do the SWAT, right? Did she bring up SWAT? No, and she definitely could have brought that up, right? Those questions would be stronger if she wanted to do a third party culprit. So it's like, no, she, all the questions she's asking, or all the questions. The prosecution was only 20%. put out so there. Only That's the why items. the bill doesn't like Most it. There are all prosecution stories that were put out there that are against her client. Jumps up to and then you got Bill over so here, so you flustered. The more he's like, the more you said, oh, you said, you said that, oh, oh, he, he, he was talking the victim. That's false. Why do you give a fuck, Bill? You want to go, you want the guy so to go if, die. If you want to go get shot. Report, Why do you oh, care if it's false or not? False, false information. You didn't even get a legal okay. arrest. Well, we can tell. Because you went and got and a grand jury to but indict you, you, you him. Were earlier that it, you didn't want to present your case. Think, you got a grand jury to indict the guy. Absolutely correct. That once people uh, have a, an opinion, they're not going to let go. I mean, give me a break. 
Yeah. I could see if he yes. was pissed yes. if she was so asking those persistence, questions, persistence, but even those sure questions that, she can that, ask. That, that, Just yeah. like I said, yeah. I could ask. Yeah. I could do my yeah. own. Yeah, yeah. like you talk about everybody okay. has a, you know, In some Donald ways, Trump, I'm really, so really doing it, guy. Except, yeah. except yeah. I, I won't. Did you the reason why I won't yeah. is because so. this town, right. this little so, town, um, thank you, you just know. They would figure out who I was. Questions I'm going to try to hide it honestly because you know they figured out. Your Honor, I, I, I don't like, have any other questions for Dr. Edelman, and, and we do have a summary and for the court. And I get arrested because okay. I tell them that's not mind. this place. Okay, sure. It's uh, my own so private Idaho, okay. like that B52. Miss Matlock is going to okay, give her a Okay, just one second. I, I'm just one second. I got to kiss Bill's ass for a minute. I need to worry about Holy shit. Are you are you okay? Yes. Okay. Uh okay. Well, um thank Leslie, you, Dr. Leslie, Edelman. Leslie. Uh, Come on. Did you see my video on that me. one? So um you okay? Oh, th you're asking the question. Okay, yes, okay, Leslie. Okay, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you, Jen. I realize yes, it's, yes. it's late in the day. And I'm afraid right. that, that I've been a good um, one. This takes about nine minutes. Exactly. To sum this up. But I do want to talk about something in advance because you're asking I questions better, of our I'm expert sorry. about his process and changing the process that is impacted in the United States Supreme Court law. And the United States Supreme Court law requires that part of the analysis for the court on presumed prejudice include false media coverage. Thank you. It's not enough for it to be Look all truthful judge. media coverage. So judge. before you um, start suggesting that an expert change his Maybe methodology that's, that's accepted, Practice. Would be good. It's really important that you go back and look at Skilling and Haddon and the lineage of cases that get us to venue <laughs> and what the court has to good. decide um, in determining presumption. Right now. The question you asked be answered today is where do we go from here in the survey process? Oh, too, I want to answer that question in two parts by summarizing what we can do and what we can't do. We can and we oh, need really? to finish oh, this the process that the defense undertook. It was completely valid. It was standard in cases like this. Dr. Edelman is an expert in this field, and he has done this jury research and this work for 15 years. Nothing about the format, the methodology, the questions, or the fact of the survey itself was wrong. You've talked about two questions that you are describing as false because they're not in the affidavit. But if you look at that affidavit and what the media has done with those things is they have created a narrative based on the facts that are represented in the affidavit. Now, I would agree that there are a lot of, there's a lot of information in that affidavit that is just flat and not true. But if we focus on where we are right now, there are representations in the affidavit about multiple trips to Moscow from Pullman and a return trip so there, to Moscow from Pullman like, in the morning in that, that, that lead a reader to got, the word of she, stalking bad bitch. that you Mazel, have a problem with that S word being teams. included. I did a video Reflect on Reflect back on the case law ago, in the United States State Supreme, Supreme Court about showing false information, but also one. look at that affidavit and the way the media has construed that in its representations in its first name. reporting that is so I prejudicial have a video on her because anymore. the basis for this spin the foundation She's is right baddie. there in what you are describing as the public record now i fundamentally disagree that that the only public record in this case is what's there um on the 12 page uh docket he's not gonna um, the, ball. The, the public record in this case that the entire nation in the world and looking at and especially Lataw county is derived and construed out of that she's that like the lebron record. james you know so she's just not going to the that she's this gonna, public record thing not is really it. kind of circling around because what's what's the purpose then of the uh, non-dissemination order 
Is this it's, this judge is definitely in in red legacy? Is, I'm sorry, I can't. What's the purpose of the nomination? Well, my understanding, Your Honor, is that to protect it's the, the one of the primary the issues was the credibility of the person that is out there speaking. We oh, did not okay. want law enforcement, 159 officers out there talking about police reports and disseminating that. We didn't want the prosecutor doing press conferences like we saw on 1230, 2022. Oh, yeah. We didn't want the defense getting up and doing press conferences based on the information because we have information that no one else um, has. And we are consulting with experts that the public doesn't know about. And so we have a level of credibility that the others uh, don't have. And so that is my understanding of what we're trying to get a hold of. And, and it's and it's been pretty effective in this case until this um, valid survey that happens in high profile cases has been construed to be something um, nefarious which it absolutely is not. As you've heard, it's been used in Boston bombing, the Parkland shooting, the Colorado theater, George Floyd, hundreds of cases going back decades. Dr. Edelman's declaration and now his testimony are uncontroverted evidence before this court on this issue. It's the actual evidence that the court, and, and finally today, you're getting informed about the validity and the science behind the process. Nothing that was done is worth the hysteria and the hyperbole that keeps getting expressed in this courtroom. The questions asked, oh, that was the topics, great. the order, no, the open-ended, the specifics, the they were she all just, done just using so information that chair. is out there I love for it. everyone to see. And she the research methods used determine what the was out there is, worth the hysteria. is the traditional it. way and the scientific the method that like experts in this field women. use, like, oh just my God, as oh Dr. Ellen testified. what she did. I love it. Yes. And to be sure, the purpose of this is to give you information so that you can make an informed decision about venue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not for a nefarious purpose. It's to arm you I'm gonna be with honest, facts like, and information so that you can I, apply I usually can, the United States Supreme cases at, that have been adopted I mean, in Idaho good. and determine, determine not whether or not there's presumed prejudice. You know, when we first started talking about whether or not there was going to be this venue hearing um, sooner rather than later, uh, oh, Ms. On. Beatty for the state said at least three times, Judge, they can't just come in here with affidavits. This case law says that they have to have more. The more that we are gathering to provide like, you, excuse me, at guys, least can part of it, make room is for an survey. actual attorney, please. Thanks. In terms of the process, proposition her that this and survey Bill, she's going to be the, the trial role. attorney by the way first of all here you heard from dr she's, Ellen. The, she's the star player yeah. if someone the answers player. they don't know a second she's question the the trial into that is asked she does and the process trial. stops not there's him. no other questions not other than them. demographics because they don't want my opinion. to poison from based um, on anybody who doesn't did. know. She's the so one that's going to be doing trial. For there to be this proposition that all of so these Bill questions, design questions that are later we'll on start. in the process were put out there intentionally fumble. to poison the jury pool, it's that's just flat false. And the other point is you can't taint what's tainted. She's like, we hear what that's the Bill. statistics are. She'll As it relates and swim to around this like county, ninety-seven percent of the people had familiarity <laughs> with the case. Seventy-nine percent of the people knew five or more prejudicial and false media reports. Eighty-one percent of those who had heard about the stalking had determined and and had a had, took a position that Mr. Koberger is guilty. These people that were surveyed didn't form the opinion when they were being surveyed. Exactly. And they right. didn't then go yep. research their already strongly held opinion because of the survey. These are deeply held opinions in this community within this jury pool. 
Thank God. The Laycock County citizens have accepted the information placed before them by state actors. It's not just Mr. Thompson that did a media report and talked about the uh, probable cause affidavit. Chief Fry, the coroner, Kathy Mavitt. I'll be right back. Uh, We've got search warrants from Pennsylvania out there in the public record. We've got hundreds of search warrants in the public record out there um, from Idaho. We've got all kinds of pleadings. This is all information that's put out in into the media. And, and having the state now claim this moral high ground is an oxymoron. It's a complete oxymoron for state actors to put this information out in the public and now say, hey, wait, if you wanna ask if people have believed the information that we've put out there, you can't do that. That harms Mr. Koberger. We as a defense team have the obligation and frankly the privilege of defending Mr. Koberger and defending his right to a fair trial. And in doing so, in arguing that venue should be changed, we have to show you that there is presumed prejudice in this community. And since we have the burden of this, and you now know essentially from this expert that there is presumed prejudice in Lane County, you have to ask yourself, do you want more information to know where the better venue is? And that takes me to the next point, which is what we cannot do. You've heard Dr. Edelman say that it goes outside of his standard of practice um, and the, the, his, the um, scientific method that has been used for decades, that has been used in hundreds of cases to take your ideas about what should be in uh, questions, to take the state's ideas about what's being in questions, should be in, in questions in the survey. He follows a process. That's the process that he needs to follow because he has to provide the court with apples to apples comparison. Another issue that has um, was addressed last week that I want to touch upon, and there are two, is this concept that if we just done a juror questionnaire, it would have addressed all of that. At the stage that we're at now, which is setting ourselves up for and preparing for a venue hearing, Okay, I'm back, guys. We have to justify a venue change. Standard that you're going to be looking at, according to the Supreme Court, is whether or not a presumption exists where the record demonstrates that the community is saturated with prejudicial faults and inflammatory <laughs> media publicity about the crime. Exactly. The case law mentions the Star Spangled Banner or something. Media publicity about the crime. That's what the survey assesses now. The judge is just- Another like way to determine actual prejudice is a questionnaire. And that is done prior to selecting the jury. And at that time, we are looking Let for me break it down for you, fellas. This is individual bias oh of the God. prospective juror. There are different methods used at different stages of the case. And right now, the proper method is embarrassing. Survey. Does this have to another work? solution that you mentioned last Thursday was simply to strike 400 people surveyed from the veneer? And I want to talk about that. First of all, that doesn't address the problem that's very clear that we have in Laytop County. And so, if you extrapolate uh, the the percentage of people that have uh, drawn a conclusion about Mr. Koberger's guilt. If you extrapolate that to the county with numbers like 81% have concluded if they um, are familiar with the media information about stalking, there's no prospective jurors in this in this county. You mentioned, you know, this is um, 1%, but there's much more analysis to what the prospective jury poll is here. Pool is here. First of all, the jury commissioner, I think you talked about her when we were talking about whether or not jury trial was going to be 
a speedy trial was going to be waived. You said, I think it had expanded the pool to a thousand. Am I right about that number? That I can't remember. It was probably maybe more. Okay. So if you extrapolate the numbers that we know of prejudice exists, the judge I mean, that Texas leaves us with a very a small case, uh, jury pool for trying to uh, do uh, voir dire in a death penalty case. But if you look at the population as a whole, what the U.S. Census says about Latah County is that almost 18 percent of the population here is under the age of 18. Almost 18 percent of the population here is over the age of 65. That eliminates, you know, close to 35 percent of the population that's even eligible to be in your jury pool. Second, and more importantly, I can't find statutory and legal authority for you to strike 400 people out of the veneer up front. I found the opposite. Give it to us. As you know, the clerk of the jury yes. commissioner pulls from the jury poll that's approved by Idaho Code. And this is a really important section in Idaho Code 2-202. It is the policy of this state the judge that now? all persons no. selected for jury service be selected at random from a fair cross section of the population and that all qualified citizens have the opportunity to be considered for jury service. Rest assured, I was just being sarcastic. Oh, okay. really? Well, I, I you took your sarcasm like to heart, I guess, okay. last I week. I apologize. Uh, because it was a very serious day, right? Yes. Every day is very serious. Right, but uh, last Thursday was in particularly um, a tough Bill, one. I think we can all agree. I was going to say it. It's going to be more, more tough Stop ones this. to Sorry. For I'm sure, not a feminist, for sure. By the way. And we all need He's to give each other hundred percent misogynist. Sorry, guys. That's I will end by saying it. this. Our defense team firmly, and I mean firmly, believes in Mr. Koberger's innocence. And right okay. now he's being held to have a trial in a county that believes that he is guilty. In this country, we pride ourselves on a jury system that doesn't stand for that. In this moment, I see that you have two choices. You can let us continue and do comparative surveys as planned. Or you can maintain the stay. And at the venue motion, you will hear that the data for Latah County shows a presumption of prejudice. But you will not have comparative surveys to fully inform the court. As you consider this, there is absolutely nothing that gets risked if you change venue. But if you deny a change of venue, Mr. Koberger's constitutional right to a fair trial is denied. There's only one human being in this case with a right to a fair trial. It's Mr. Koberger's and his alone. There's no legal right of this community to have a jury trial here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Clarkson? Oh my God, right? Let's, I just want Marissa to make a show up because she's like the best. Let me bring this back into perspective. Our motion oh deals with the court's non dissemination order. It was agreed to by the defense. In fact, the idea of the non-dissemination order was initiated by the defense their February 30th, 2022 motion for a non-dissemination order uh, to prevent extrajudicial statements. That would be statements outside of the public record, which is the court record, uh, that have a substantial likelihood of heightening public condemnation of the accused. And the state's position is that the fact-specific questions, and I, I understand, Dr. Edelman, why the questions are asked. I understand his explanation. It doesn't change the fact that we have a non-dissemination order that specifically prohibits that kind of dissemination of facts, specific facts about this case. Facts that include those that are not true, acknowledged from the stand that they are not true. Which, interestingly enough, I look at the PowerPoint and slide 15, which talks about the American Society of Trial Consultants Professional Code on Venue Survey, says false facts should generally not be used to test accuracy of other responses in venue surveys. So if false facts are used, they must be clearly false. There's no possibility that respondents who know about the case use false facts, true facts that have been publicized. 
so they can just see me. We have an inconsistency there, which frankly is logical. It makes sense. And the state is coming from a point, a position of being practical and trying to use common sense here. As I listen to what we have heard today, and in part from last week, it seems that the position of the defense is it is okay to risk tainting additional jurors in order to ascertain bias of other potential jurors. And I'm not sure that that's the way this court should do business. If we accept what the defense is suggesting at this point, and again, we are not arguing venue today, and so I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to get into all these numbers and all those sorts of things. We'll save those for, for another day. But if we were to accept that we have perhaps on one issue, 20% of the jury pool statistically available, well, that's more than enough people to select a jury from. So it's not nearly as overwhelming, overwhelmingly compelling as I think it's being suggested here. Um, I want to be clear again, uh, Ms. Massoff used the word nefarious several times, suggesting the defense was, or that the state was accusing the defense of being nefarious. And if you're not, Your Honor, I, I am not suggesting that there was any will, ill will or motive by anybody over here. What we are suggesting and what we believe that the record shows is that this court issued a specific order prohibiting the dissemination of specific types of information, including the identity or nature of evidence expected to be presented, including the performance of results of the examination or test. There's no question that those nine questions included violations of the court's no contact order. That's what we're here about. And apparently there was some miscommunication or misunderstanding between about the integrity or the importance of the non-dissemination order. Um, it sounds like today that maybe because these types of surveys are common nationwide, then the non-dissemination order really doesn't matter, which is a little disconcerting, but I don't care about what happens anywhere else. All I care about is what happens in Lake Talk County, in this court. It's far above my pay grade to go and analyze what happens in a big city or some other part of the country. I know Lake Talk County. That's where my interests are. That's where our interests are here. On the issue of whether the survey can be changed, I think that that does present some challenges based on what we've heard here today. Uh, but the solution for that is very easy. We just back up, and if the defense wants to pursue the survey, they do a new survey with a new group of people and take out the objectionable questions. And then once they've done that, they proceed to do that identical survey in other veneers around the state, whichever ones they want to select. And that would be the proper way to do this. Now, we may hear, oh, my goodness, that's going to consume time, or that's going to consume a lot of money. Well, I'll tell you right now, I don't care. If it can't be done right, or if that's what it takes to do it right, then we need to do it. This is a big case. And the finger for this cannot be pointed to anybody but the defense. I'm not suggesting an evil intent, but the practical effect of the decisions made on behalf of the defense was to ask these questions and to create the situation that we've been having to deal with now for two hearings over the past week, well into the evening on Wednesday. That's the way forward, Judge. Thanks. Judge, I'm just going to end really quickly with this. We didn't violate the non dissemination order. You know, the, the information that now he's calling facts, you know, it's flip flopping between whether or not it's uh, a false fact or a fact that's, that's in the survey. 
The information that was put in the survey is based on the public record and information that the way that the state and state actors put information into the public record that has now been disseminated. And we have not violated that order. And I do resent being accused of that. I appreciate that. Um, I mean, those two questions were not in the public record. Okay. They were. I mean, they came out. Oh my God, this but judge. That was not the, not the, uh, the court, the, the, the um, I mean, where it came from. It just came out of the media or somewhere. Who knows where it came from? Okay, but Who knows I don't where think there's anything from? not that I'm aware of in the in the public record that said anything about that about your client. So I mean here we are. I mean that happened. It's kind of unfortunate. Uh I, I totally understand uh the the reason to have false information out there. Do you but, though? I mean, Do you I, really I understand to, that? Because I feel that like up. you don't. The other, the other questions. That's all from the public record. I don't question. But anybody tell you can find some somewhere in the in the public uh, public record that those uh, claims were made. I. But I think both sides are looking at a different definition of what public record is. I think yeah, it right, Leslie. It's the public record from the case. So that aside, I, I appreciate um, the testimony. Uh, I feel like the judge could sides, do this, honestly. Challenging he really feels like a issue. beast to me, but uh, I'm not, I'm not set on that just yet. Struggle through. Yeah, you guys can give me some out, input. Uh, um, and I understand that there's some urgency to get that out, so I'll, I'll do my best. Probably not going to be this week. So. Anything else we need to talk about, Ms. Taylor? Your Honor, just um, the logistics of the court's decision is yet to come. We can't continue the surveys. And we've got deadlines next week, midweek, for briefing and the motion for change of venue for May. So I'm wondering if we want to consider resetting that motion Look and that deadline now. Over there. I still want to keep the hearing on May 14th. We have a motion to compel already filed to be heard that day. So we could still use reserve court time to make some further advances in the case. But I'm concerned about being properly prepared for the change of venue, waiting for the decision, especially if we're allowed to continue to work. Sure. And I, I told you last week that I would give you more comments. I won't be terrible. Um, so you want to change that hearing? You want to leave the May? We're set on May 14 at 1.30. We have. You want to keep that for the motion to compel? Yes, please. But you want to move out uh, the hearing on change of name? I believe that's the only prudent thing to do at this time. Um, yes, Judge, I think that we should. Um, Based on some availability of team members and experts, you can really though, see the difference in skill think level now. We're not ready, or we won't have and the, other the team available training. until the fourth week of June for all I'm of not the putting people that are you down. I'm just saying that other woman. You want to just wait and just talk to each other. Is uh, really excellent. Talk, you know, just 
you know, that hearing. And he's fortunate to have her. Judge, I, I don't. I, don't I, think I we're going to have an agreement on the change of venue issue. Um, if I if I thought we could come and to an agreement on that, I'd say yes. Like let's she not her to be part of the team. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not suggesting that you would agree on agreement on that on change of venue. I just mean changing the here, the date. I, Your Honor, we would suggest the last week of June, and if the prosecutor is ready to weigh in on that and the court's ready, we'd prefer to get a date now. Okay. Mr. Thompson, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it would be appropriate to reset the dates uh, and really what what's going to drive this in part, well, in large part, will be your Honor's decision on what we've been talking about today. Uh, but I think it may be prudent for the court to, it would be prudent for the court to vacate the hearing on a motion for change of venue and prepare a reset, um, a briefing schedule, and a hearing date on the motion for change of venue to a reasonable future time. Okay. To allow the parties to react to whatever the court's decision may be, and I don't want the court to feel pressured on the time of its decision. I'd rather take the time to do it right. letting the judge know uh, we should feel pressured. Isn't that that's real big of you, Bill? That's great. Well, I won't rush it. Uh, I agree. And I will feel the pressure. I agree. Uh, you really need that. that because that uh, last. How about we set this ridiculous. for one third? We'll vacate the uh, hearing on change the venue and reset it for January 27. That's a Thursday, which is, seems to be a good day or just generally except today. What did I say? June. Sorry. Your Honor. It's a long day. J June, June 27. I thought you said the end of June, right? June 27 is perfect. <laughs> I, I am thinking, though, that if we should maybe schedule for a full day. We estimated an hour for this, and we are well beyond that now, and we anticipate testimony. Oh, testimony. Interesting. Oh, I see that question you just said, the other three DNA There's profiles. Yeah. Does that work? It will, thank you. Yeah. I'm just really happy that you got, what do you think, Leslie? Mazoth is good, right? Denver for you, Mr. Thompson? Yes, sir, we should, yep. we should be, we are available that day. Those of who we were right here. Okay. He's on the oh, team. That includes right? Ms. Jennings. Uh, and then hopefully Ms. Beatty and Mr. Well, I'm going to ask them next, and then I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Massa. I'm good. Okay. Great. Right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nye and Ms. Beatty. Yes, Your Honor. That date and time works for us as well. Oh my gosh. I okay, feel perfect. like the guys in the okay, room. Okay. 10 o'clock. Get out of here. 27. <laughs> Um, okay, is there anything? Oh, yeah, briefs. What do you think? Oh, is Leslie, there, that's okay. I mean, I, I know you can't know. Yeah, you've, until we've been I hanging out for hours. I mean, so. I appreciate it. I really do. Your Honor, the, the briefing schedule that the court gave us was... Uh, roughly about awesome. a month prior to the hearing. I hear you, Sip. Um, we could try that, but if the court's hey, Sip, decision takes you, a uh, while you know and if we want to do, if we're allowed to finish our surveys, then we might have to have some time to do a supplemental. Sure. I'll be flexible. I did a, a video on who the bailiff was. Let's say. Good, Leslie. I mean, Mazoth is a really good survey. Check her out on your. I mean, you uh, can just Google her. You don't have to watch the video out. I did, but um, if you Google her, you'd see yeah. she's Especially she's good. Well, like you, people would want to hire her to defend uh, that. Like she's yeah. she's good. Mr. Edelman, uh, Dr. Edelman told but me. The that, you know, It's you interesting to find out who that bailiff is. That takes me back to jail. He's somebody that we know, guys. Like, yeah, uh, I get it, Leslie. I mean, that bailiff is a former uh, Moscow Police Department employee uh, who was on the uh, 
drug test? Your Honor, or? we're allowed to finish what we started. We think from the time we could get it going, it would be three weeks. And then Dr. Edelman would need a bit of time to assimilate drug the data into in a Hotlatch, report. Idaho. You think uh, a if all formant went well that uh, you can have your briefs? Yes, I'm going to schedule information a live for tomorrow. I'll post it. Have a good night, yes. Leslie. Yes. Uh, your Honor, we caveat unless there's a, yeah, a long caveat, delay. Caveat, caveat, yeah. caveat, okay. If there's not a long delay in me knowing what we can do, yes. Okay, no need to get a little snarky there, Judge. What do you think for the state, maybe a deadline of June 14th? So he decided to transfer from MPD. Um, so actually, I, actually, I think after his uh, big bust, after Brian Ms. got Beatty arrested, he decided to become a, a sheriff's okay. bailiff. Ms. Beatty? So and Your Honor, Mr. Nye and I will both be handling that, but that works for us. Okay, fantastic. Well, who, where's the voice coming from? The omnipotent voices. Who are those people? And then, um, oh, um, maybe a you reply know what? Let me see. I'm blanking on his freaking name. I feel bad now. Um, he retired. I have it in one of the videos I did. Um, hold on, let me say. We can do that. Okay. Anyway. That'll give me time to. I'll look at I can all find it, but if not, I'll I'll um. See, I'll look. I have a video. It says who's guarding right. who's Thank guarding the patience. defendant. Um, um. Anything else? Then we have to talk about this one motion. You said we'll put it at the end of the case, and at the end of the day. Oh, the He's a former MPD. Yes, I'll yes. take a look um, at that. Yeah, one. I have a video on right. it. It says right. who's guarding the all defendant. Right. We, and there's a picture of Brian and him on the cover. The issues that I have, have if they're redacted, the then we would have a stipulation. So, I'll just show them what I've talking about. Let's see if we can do that. Maybe it means it, nothing, but you two can yes, sir. to okay. me, it's okay. coincidence. Anything else is that? Ms. Taylor? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. Of course. No, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for everybody's endurance, and have a good evening. Thank you. Any Sorry. hot mic Sorry. moments? Look at that judge's smile. Man, he's like, I think he is Beavis. Okay, guys. So, whoops. Let me go back over here. Stop sharing. So, anybody that's still here, I got like, I got like uh, some ride and dies here. Guys, thanks so much for being here with the live stream with me. And um, <clears throat> I plan on doing all the live streams for the trial. Um, and I appreciate you guys being here and chatting. And um, I'm going to do a live tomorrow. I'm going to schedule it so you'll see it. You'll see it on my page, however that comes up. And hopefully I'll see you guys tomorrow. So have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye.